Hey, this episode of The Majority Report is brought to you by Sunset Lake CBD. Sunset Lake CBD is located in Vermont, just outside of Burlington. They're a farm that used to uh, provide dairy for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. I think they still do, but they decided to um, diversify. They're working with the University of Vermont on regenerative farming practices. They use 100% pesticide-free and only organic fertilizers uh, when it comes to growing their CBD. You can look at the third-party test to see the purity um, uh, for their products at sunsetlakecbd.com. They have great business practices, 15 bucks an hour for uh, their workers as a minimum wage, I should say. Employees own the majority of the company, but more importantly than, well, I don't know if it's more importantly than all that, but in terms of the product, we were all CBD skeptics around here. I know I was, and all I had really done is tried the tinctures and this and that, and I just never found them to be terribly effective. Uh, they Sunset Lake CBD, they're fans of the show. They sent me some products, and I was like, this actually works. It helps me sleep. Then I ended up using the salve for my, uh, my eczema. I sent the salve to friends. One guy who had shingles, he had back pain, helped. Got emails from people saying it helped with their arthritis. And then uh, Matt, who is a smoker guy, said the smokables. Yep. You were very anti-CBD back then. I was. I had a bad Venice Beach CBD experience, but... uh, Who hasn't, though? Who hasn't had a bad (laughs) Venice Beach CBD experience? But yeah, the small uh, product line, I'm a big fan of. So uh, there's smokables, there's gummy bears, and they have um, uh, gummies, I think, are 1,000 meg. They have a tincture now that's 3,000 meg. Um, they have coffee beans that are infused with CB, uh, CBD, which great tasting coffee, but also takes the edge off a little bit. Smoking CBD is actually an incredible experience. I've never, I never realized it, but you get that, uh, that sort of like physical high, right? Would that, is that the way you describe it, Matt? You get the physical high, but you don't get the, um, the, like the, you don't, you don't have, you don't get paranoid. Yeah. More of a body high. Body high. Um, check it out. Use the coupon code left is best at sunsetlakecbd.com. You get 20% off your order. They're fans of the show. Left is best. One word left is best. In fact, somebody sent me the uh, video of the left is best where that meme started. And it was actually pretty fun. It was, that's almost four years ago now. Um, <laughs> sunsetlakecbd.com left is best 20% off. Check it out. Start the show. Friday. That means Monday is Casual Monday. Tuesday, Casual Tuesday. Wednesday, Casual Hump Day. Thursday, Casual Thurs. That's what we call it. And Friday, Casual Shabbat. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday. September 11th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. It's Casual Friday, folks. I'm here in a soft-collared shirt. And joining me for the entire program today is one of two candidates for the congressional seat in the 14th district of California. Shahid Buttar challenging Nancy Pelosi for that congressional seat. Also on the program today, congratulations to Nancy Pelosi. She managed to give away the continuing resolution The government will stay open, but there will be absolutely zero economic aid for the over 30 million jobless and growing in this country. Never mind our cities, our states, our schools, etc. I have a feeling that might come up today. Meanwhile, we have unprecedented wildfires raging in California and the Northwest. 
dozens killed, thousands evacuated, and it's just the beginning of the season. Donald Trump brags he saved MBS's ass. It was obvious, but it's nice to hear him say it. And the Trump administration secretly has been withholding millions of dollars from the New York Fire Department 9-11 Health Fund. OSHA finds a meat processor $10 per COVID infection and nothing for the four deaths and 43 hospitalizations brought about by unsafe work conditions there. In a preview of what's to come, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court delays mail-in ballots being sent out to voters. ProPublica has a report. Abusive NYPD cops have moved up the ranks to the highest positions in the New York Police Department. And there's a blackout. We have no mechanism to track COVID infections in schools in this country. Federal court blocks Trump's attempt to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census. You remember the census. That's a constitutionally mandated counting of every single individual in the country, regardless of what their citizenship status is. And Chris Coons gives us a preview of Democratic corporate giveaways that we can expect more of, presumably, uh, once he has an opportunity to be in the majority in the Senate. All this and more on today's program. And a correction, I'm sorry. Uh, When we bring him on, uh, Shahid Buttar is, of course, uh, in the 12th congressional district running for uh, uh, challenging Nancy Pelosi, who is the um, longtime uh, congresswoman there. And, of course, she is also the Speaker of the House. Let's get to this first, because the, um, you know, like I say, there's nothing uh, particularly um, earth shatteringly new in the uh, revelations from Bob Woodward, or at least ones that you wouldn't glean if you were, you know, you paying attention. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of Americans uh, don't pay that much of attention uh, to the news. And, um, Hearing Donald Trump say in his own voice in February that, yeah, no, this is much worse than the flu. This is five times, the death rate is five times more. And it's not just about touching stuff. It's in the air. Hearing him say that really, uh, I I think, I, I would imagine, is going to impact some votes. At the very least, um, it is not unreasonable to speculate What would have happened had we heard that at the time in terms of like just the messaging that would have been forced upon the Trump administration in terms of like, hey, wait a second. This is all about the air. This is five times. People have to take this seriously. We heard you say it on the tape. I mean, I think there's a decent argument. It could have saved thousands of lives. And, and frankly, I think we would be in much better shape in terms of sending our kids to schools. It would, have, it, would have, it would have given leverage to the scientists. Instead of, you can read now articles about how the CDC was completely sitting there, um, a, a perfect target to be rolled and uh, essentially degraded because they had no political acumen. And this would have provided at least some basis to to push back on the Trump administration. But Tucker Carlson has a different take. Um, And here it is. That for repeated interviews with Bob Woodward. Why in the world would he do that? Well, tonight from a source who knows the answer to that mystery, Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina. It was Lindsey Graham who helped convince Donald Trump to talk to Bob Woodward. Lindsey Graham brokered that meeting. Lindsey Graham even sat in on the first interview between Bob Woodward and the president. How'd that turn out? Now, remember, Lindsey Graham is supposed to be a Republican. So why would he do something like that? You'd have to ask him. But keep in mind that Lindsey Graham has opposed, passionately opposed, virtually every major policy initiative that Donald Trump articulated when he first ran. 
from ending illegal immigration to pulling back from pointless wars to maintaining law and order at home. Lindsey Graham was against all of that more than many Democrats. So maybe you already know the answer. Wow. Of course, it also uh, begs the question, uh, how did Lindsey Graham manage to do a 180 on all those things that he was uh, supposedly so uh, concerned about? But that's not what uh, Tucker Carlson's about. I have no problem with Tucker Carlson sinking Lindsey Graham. Uh, and dropping him and, and having a um, uh, Jamie Harrison win that uh, Senate seat in South Carolina. But uh, the bottom line is, uh, since we're talking about Bob Woodward, I guess I'm glad that Bob Woodward uh, recorded this and, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll put that down for posper- posterity. Uh, I imagine in the absence of that Bob Woodward thing, I don't know, we maybe would be on to a different scandal that Donald Trump was involved in. But the idea that this guy should be praised for holding on to this information. Now, people forget this because I haven't seen anybody mention this, but I remember it distinctly. He did the same exact thing with George W. Bush. He had inside information. He had gone in and done a lot of reporting. He didn't release it until after the 2005 uh, election because he had a book to monetize period, end of story. And at that time, he was working as a reporter for the Washington Post. So he specifically did not put it into his stories, stuff that he knew that was going on in the White House, stuff that was arguably illegal, stuff that showed massive incompetence. And he held that stuff for his book after 2005. Now, I'll tell you why I remember this so uh, vividly is because I was quite angry about it at the time. And I was starting my nascent uh, radio career and I was asked to MC a theatrical reading of All the President's Men. I guess Billy Crudup was there because I went back and I looked at that. I had no idea. I, I still wouldn't know him if he was in this room, but I guess he, I recognize the name. But there was a bunch of other actors, um, I think very, some very prominent actors. And, um, and Carl Bernstein was playing a role as well. So there was like, so I went up on stage and I said, uh, very uh, excited that Carl Bernstein's here and all these actors, I can't remember the prominent names. And I said, it's, it's apropos that uh, Bob Woodward's not here because the Bob Woodward of this era is gone. The Bob Woodward of the era that exists today is one who's gonna monetize this stuff and put that over the, um, uh, put his ability to monetize and build his own career and rank that as more important than actually informing the public and in timely fashion where they can actually act upon the information that, that he is presenting. And I walked off stage, all the actors came up. There was, I don't know, about 15 or 20 of them. They all lined up and sat down on chairs. <laughs> they, they started to go in on the script. And when Carl Bernstein, who was like playing a small role, when they got to him, he stopped it. And he said, I have to, address what the comments that that guy said and he ripped me a new a-hole and then they continued on with the whole thing i think you can find that in the uh, new york post but the bottom line is bob woodward used this information to bolster his book sales and eight months ago we don't know if it would have saved lives but it's really hard to imagine it wouldn't have impacted any of it If it's important now, imagine what it would have been then. It wouldn't have sold his books. Fair enough. It may not have been as, you know, utilized in the political campaign, but it literally would have saved thousands of lives and probably, probably saved part of the economy and certainly would be making it easier for kids to go back to school at this point. Had this been taken seriously from the beginning, had the Trump administration, by his own words, had been held to that standard and understanding of what this was that we were dealing with, it's very hard to imagine that we wouldn't have heard something, uh, that, that, that it wouldn't have impacted the way our government and our society responded to this. I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to believe. And certainly, certainly, Bob Woodward making that decision in that moment couldn't have, couldn't have come to the conclusion, this wouldn't mean anything in terms of the way that we respond to this disease. So um, put that in Bob Woodward's pipe and smoke it, if you will. 
Um, let's, uh, I get a couple of ads here. Oh, and uh, speaking of this coronavirus time, there's been a lot of changes in my life. One of them has been, I use a bidet. I mean, I don't use it uh, in the office, but at home I do now. Wow. And for, I guess, you know, for, uh, for many people around the world, it's, it's been, it's the most obvious thing in the world to do. For years, bidets have been available, but hideously expensive. They've cost thousands of dollars. Well, I want to welcome you to Hello Tushy. It's a modern bidet attachment. It was super easy to put on, and it's here to democratize the blessings bestowed by bidets and offer, if you will, clean buttholes to everyone. Hello Tushy cleans your butt with a precise stream of fresh water for $79. You get multiple cleanings for that. In fact, you, um, a lifetime, if you will. It attaches to your existing toilet. It requires no electricity, no additional plumbing. It cuts toilet paper use by 80%. The Hello Tushy bidet pays for itself in a few months. And when there's the next uh, the, uh, you know, uh, run on toilet paper, you're okay. What happens, you don't wipe it all. Even the best two-ply can't cut it when it comes to hands-free poop experience. Ditched paper products and uncomfortable chafing when you switch to the soothing, cleansing stream of water from a Hello Tushy bidet. And every Hello Tushy bidet attachment comes with a 60-day risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. You can join millions of people who are happy Hello Tushy customers right now and have a clean butt with every flush. Look, this is what you do. It's, it's, a, it's a piece that's like about this big. It attaches between the toilet seat and the toilet bowl. You unscrew it. You can do it with uh, the unscrewing the thing. You don't even need any tools. You need one wrench to come in with the water, intercept it before it goes into the uh, toilet bowl. It's super easy to do. It took about maybe, maybe 20 minutes to hook up. You hook it up. It works automatically. There's no electricity involved in this thing. It's just a function of the water that's already there. You go to hellotushy.com slash majority, you get 10% off. This is a special offer for our listeners. Go to hellotushy.com slash majority, 10% off. Hellotushy.com slash majority. If you've ever met anybody who has switched to a bidet, they don't stop talking about it for like a half an hour because it's that much of a revelation. So uh, check it out. Meanwhile, Thousands of business owners also during uh, this coronavirus have discovered the benefits of stamps.com. They've been able to keep their businesses running. They've been able to avoid the crowds at the post office, all from their own computers. Stamps.com brings all the mailing and shipping services you need right to your computer in the comfort of your home or office, whether you're a small business sending invoices, you're an online seller shipping out products, whether you're, let's say, a 15-year-old girl selling the clothes that your dad gives you on Depop. And then thinking that you're a business mogul because you're making all this money at 100% profit, stamps.com can handle it all with ease. I'm not, I'm not implying anything, but I'm just telling you. This has been my experience. You use your computer, print out official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once your mail is ready, you just leave it for your mail carrier. They schedule, you can schedule a pickup or you drop it off in a mailbox. You also get great discounts with stamps.com, five cents off every stamp and up to 62% of USPS and UPS shipping rates and no residential surcharges. Stamps.com, no brainer. Saves you time, saves you money. Right now, listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in majority report. That's stamps.com majority report. And lastly, look, I get a lot of questions um, throughout the year, particularly towards this time of year, but throughout the year, what's a good charity for me to give to? What's one that's going to actually have some impact? And, and people are looking for all like a wide range of stuff. And, and sometimes I know what to tell them. Sometimes I don't. Every year, there's millions of people who suffer from easily preventable diseases. There's people who suffer from enormous poverty. There's people from su who suffer from a, a whole myriad of, of problems. When you want to give some money and you want to know where it's going to have the most impact, check out givewell.org. 
For over 10 years, GiveWell.org has helped donors find the charities and projects that save and improve lives the most per dollar. They're totally transparent on how they calculate this. They give you a list of recommended charities. You can go back and you can look in their archives and see what they have recommended over the past 10 years. And they dedicate over 20,000 hours a year to researching charitable organizations. They handpick, like I say, a small ones of the highest impact, evidence-based uh, backed charities. GiveWell isn't asking for your donations themselves. They're asking you to give to these charities they recommend. The Helen Keller International against, uh, and Against Malaria Foundation are a couple. GiveWell.org takes no fees. So all of your tax deductible donation will be uh, to help others. That's, uh, I found on GiveWell, um, the one that I, I give from GiveWell is give directly. It's basically very straightforward. You give cash. And you give cash and it goes directly to uh, poor individuals in several countries in Africa. It, it is the, I think, the most proven uh, way of raising people out of poverty is to actually just give them money. And those folks know exactly uh, how to use it in a way that will better their lives. So you can check that out. And that's why I use GiveWell. You can find others there that you like. If you have... Um, if you want to have more impact, donate soon. Any of our listeners who become new GiveWell donors will have their first donation matched up to $100. So uh, when you select podcast and majority report at checkout, you'll get a $100 matching gift to the uh, charity of your choice. This matching offer is, is good for as long as these funds last. Check it out last. All of these will be uh, linked in uh, our podcast description and in our um, our YouTube description. All right, I want to bring to the program, uh, hopefully, the uh, next congressperson from the 12th district in California, uh, he, making his return visit to the Majority Report. Uh, Shahid Buttar, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. It's great to be with you. Now, look, I want to start off. Um, I think the last time you were here was I don't know, maybe at the beginning of the summer. Um, here, I and, think sometime, yeah. There was a there was a a piece in the Intercept. I think it was reported other places. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I but I need to raise it uh, so that we can move on with this. Um, there were a couple of set of accusations. One of them, which was frankly the more serious one, and I think really the peg for the story, fell apart very quickly, even in the context of the story. Um, and I think you know we're talking about somebody who I think is a little bit troubled. I don't want to go into that uh, for her sake frankly, more than anything else. But there were other uh, accusations that uh, I think it was by three campaign staffers, um, uh, two women, one man, that you were, you know, like a jerk as a boss. It wasn't, we're not talking, uh, you know, uh, Klobuchar level uh, stories here, uh, but, you know, that you were uh, very demanding, that sometimes you would yell at people, I guess, or not yell, but dress them down uh, in certain situations. Um, now, also in this same uh, report, it was clear that there was a sort of overhaul of your campaign staff. And since that point, things, your campaign has improved by a whole series of metrics that are out there. Uh, but I need to raise it. Some of it people felt was a little gendered. Other people were like, well, you just sort of jerk to everybody in, you know, that, that were complaining. I've seen, and also let me just add this. Um, there was uh, a, you know, a lot of this is, all, all of this was sort of like, there was a, a, a woman named Gloria Berry, who's the chair of the San Francisco Democratic County Central Committee and Black Lives Matter Committee. She came out and basically said like, I think the people who are complaining are a little dubious. I know these people, and it was a bad fit. Um, just to to give both sides, but but I want to give you an opportunity to to say a few words of it, and 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 then we'll move on. And I just want to say to my audience, I've dug into this stuff. With all due respect to you, I wouldn't have you on if I felt that it was um, if there was a, a a real problem here. But I want to give you an opportunity to to just address it. Thank you for that and for raising it. Just to be clear, I take the issues at stake here really seriously because gender matters, race matters, inclusion matters, and ensuring that everybody's respected in the workplace, all those things matter. And I, I particularly appreciate you raising the question. You are literally the first journalist in the nearly two months since these stories reported to even mention Gloria Berry's name 
And she's been entirely silenced by the press. This is one of three people recruited by my former staff to participate in which one of those uh, supporters of mine described in text messages that the press has seen and generally suppressed as a smear campaign. And there have been almost half a dozen different accusations, you know, before, uh, and in fact referenced in that Intercept article is a DSA resolution predicated on a false rumor started by my former colleagues that I had a pattern of inappropriate activity with my volunteers. And that fell apart even before that story was ever printed, even though it references this DSA resolution that at the time was being promoted by people who knew that the narrative they were presenting in public was false. And then after that was this accusation of harassment by someone who had previously accused me of murder, of human trafficking, the same person had accused any number of people of similar things. The same person had been frankly accused by other people of doing precisely what she said I did to her. Uh, and this was the person that my former colleagues used to get their concerns about my campaign strategy into the press. And you know, Gloria's voice is one among several that I think is really critical here because the claims about you know, my supposed toxicity in the workplace don't at least align with the experiences of either people who work with me now or any of the volunteers who've been with me long before those former staff joined me. I've been running for Congress for three years. Among the people who've been critical of me in the press, the longest any of them worked with me was nine months. Some of them only with, worked with me for a few weeks. And you know, these are people who have political motivations. It's unfortunate to me that the press amplified stories without checking the facts. And I'm particularly disappointed if there was a role or a particular part in all this, I'd you know, really emphasize there's one group, I've been endorsed by a whole series of organizations here in San Francisco, the SF Tenants Union, Democratic Socialists of America, Progressive Democrats of America, the SF Berniecrats, local members of the school board and the board of supervisors. Every single one of them, with one exception, rescinded their endorsements after these allegations were brought forward. And the only group that stuck by me is the one group that actually did an investigation, which is to say the entire city's progressive establishment presumed the accusations to be true in spite of evidence and witnesses to the contrary. And as a person of color, falsely accused and presumptively judged in public, it is disturbing to me to see self-described progressive and even socialist organizations fail to recognize long established dynamics in our society. And you know, at the end of the day, what the impact of this campaign, uh, the smears towards me has been is to neutralize the progressive establishment in San Francisco, which frankly, the, the, the institutional part of the progressive establishment from which my former colleagues came and to which they've returned since leaving my campaign, it's always supported Pelosi, but the parts of it that at least did not have taken themselves off the table. So I'm going into this election in November against the sitting speaker of the house with a great deal at stake for our entire civilization and, and every self-described socialist or progressive organization in San Francisco has basically taken themselves off the table, not based on anything I did, but on the presumption that I had done things, all kinds of things. And just to be clear, my former colleagues, in addition to accusing me of this pattern of inappropriate behavior, this supposed harassment by the person whose veracity you know, we've discussed, they've also said, I don't work hard which is just, I mean, it's laughable. I, I'm, I don't even know what to say about that. I'm the first Democrat in a generation to face Pelosi in a general election. That doesn't happen by me sitting on my hands. Right. Uh, it certainly didn't happen, you know, through the work for, with people who were with me for just a few weeks. I mean, it's the support and the supporters who put me there. And, and maybe the biggest part, I, I, and maybe another thing I'd say here, the, it is very challenging to be dragged in public for things I haven't done, especially as a person of color being subjected to racial and religious tropes. Um, but the, to see the suspension of any commitment to due process or innocence or facts, and instead to presume the legitimacy of any accusation, I think does very dangerous things to our movement. Because while I've been the target of these false claims, it is the movement that's borne the brunt of it. And, and ultimately that's what I'm committed to. I'm grateful for all the support from people who have paid enough attention to examine the facts. And I do want to particularly just note that the failures of the local press to me are especially alarming here. And they're not confined to this story. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, for instance, hasn't debated a challenger in a generation. And that's entirely because the local press hasn't held her accountable. Right. And similarly, the local press here 
didn't report any facts. They didn't, re- all the text messages documenting that my former colleagues knew they were presenting a false narrative at the time that they were reaching out to the press. All the local press outlets saw those texts and not a single one of them would correct their stories. Even The Intercept, which went back to its story a month after publishing it to basically rewrite the story, didn't issue a correction in violation of their own editorial guidelines. We had to go back to them to get them to just fix the headline. And even the story itself at the first instance, when they first wrote it was internally inconsistent. There's all kinds of fact errors to it. And I just see the crisis in journalism beyond the crisis in race uh, as independent objects of alarm. And I think a lot of people, uh, frankly, have have paid attention to one layer of this controversy, but- I think, listen, you know, my sense is there was also some internal uh, stuff going on at The Intercept, even in that piece. I mean, first of all, if you read that piece from July 23rd, it basically says, here's a person who is accusing you of something who everyone around them says is troubled, frankly. And that, in fact, you were being accused of something that their former roommate had had happen to them that they had told this person who was accusing you. So the whole thing, that whole element of it fell apart within the story that they're presenting. But that was the tent pole in which the other accusations, which clearly on themselves would not have merited a story, were presented. And to me, the thing, I got to be honest with you, um, it, it, it felt a lot like what happened with Alex Morse. Fortunately for Alex Morse, there was um, a uh, they, they, they were just more rigorous, and, and 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 also I will say this, just totally coincidentally, a big part of why the Alex Morse fell apart was because we got an email from somebody who was uh, periphery to that and ended up being the basis of a lot of the investigations that came out afterwards for the Intercept that we handed handed over. And so I think, you know, from my perspective, that made me that much more skeptical about uh, about that story. And at the very least, um, maybe, but I, I, I did some digging around in, in that and, and pursued it. And I think, it, you know, if someone was to spend that time, and like I say, I wouldn't have you on if I hadn't felt confident in in what I had read there. So, uh, or had, 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 had researched, but okay. So with that for breaking said, your piece in the Moore story, I didn't realize your role there, but, and there is a close similarity. Uh, I don't know if I've, I've been that explicit about it uh, up until this moment, but you know, it wasn't, it was really, you know, we have listeners and we had one who was a student who happened to be up uh, in that area, uh, you know, in one of the schools. And, um, I think uh, if, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I know reporters and we don't have the ability to report out things, but uh, we, you know, we just hand it off. But uh, you might've just done the same thing with me. I mean, you are the first journalist to even mention Gloria Berry's name. And, and just one, one point of potential correction, she's not the chair of the local democratic county committee, but she is elected to it. She sits on the chair and we met. One of the ways we met was at a, a D triple C meeting about a year and a half ago where we were both on our feet after one of the members of the DCCC dropped the N-word half a dozen times within 30 seconds. And, and so she understands all too well the long history of race in the city. And she's had very poignant words publicly in response to the accusations made towards me. Uh, you know, She was uh, in one of the DSA meetings in particular where just people had the most vicious slander that they were throwing at me. And she wrote publicly afterward that she felt like she just left a KKK rally. And this is not something that San Francisco establishment has grappled with or even considered. Her voice has been entirely suppressed. So just thank you so much for even bringing her into the conversation because the suppression of an Afro-Latino voice that was frankly very close to my campaign saw all the issues that went down, understands that what my former colleagues described as abuse was simply conflict between a candidate with a strategic vision and a cadre of paid campaign staff who had their own vision and then the idea that after you know I finally got them off the team, moved to more experienced staff who share my vision, and then the folks who I replaced show up months later with this set of stories, you know, shifting stories every week. And she she heard the lies and tried to expose them, and no one was willing to listen to her. And so I appreciate you at People least. People can just find it by googling, and uh, it's it's a medium piece that she wrote. At least you know uh, one of these like uh, there's it, she lays it out uh, quite. Um, uh, convincingly, in my opinion, but let's talk a little bit about uh, Nancy yeah. Pelosi and and the and the and the reasons 
uh, why you are uh, why you are running. And I got to tell you, from my perspective, and look, there's like there's two sets of issues here, right? One is the local implications. From my perspective, um, I'm not going to have somebody who's running for a specific uh, local office uh, for a backbencher on the program a couple of times, regardless of of how much I like that person or appreciate the way they're running. It's just you know, but um, and and I say this as someone who, when there was a leadership challenge uh, to Nancy Pelosi a couple of years ago that I thought she was best situated uh, to be the leader. You know, someone like Tim Ryan, I don't like his politics uh, at all. And I was worried about him being the leader. I have since come around to the point where I would rather have a leader whose politics I don't like, who is not as good at shutting down the rest of their caucus, frankly, um, because Nancy Pelosi is quite adept at, at maintaining power. And, um, and I'm quite, I'm not quite convinced that her politics are, uh, and I, you know, mine are as aligned as I might've thought. When I look at things like the HEROES Act, I mean, there's two major things and I want you to address them. Yeah. One is, um, and working backwards, one is the HEROES Act. This was a messaging bill, fine. $3 trillion bill, fine. It excluded things like automatic stabilizers, which, because supposedly it would have pushed it to a four trillion. I don't know if I've ever met a human being who would be like, well, three, three trillion is okay, but four trillion, that's way too much. Like there's no, you know, nobody can conceive of those numbers anyways, but that's right. supposedly the reason why it was there. I'm right. dubious about, I'm skeptical about that because this, this, this bill supposedly is gonna work as two things. One, we passed this stuff and it's in there. And the other is it lays a marker for where the Democratic Party can go in the event that they take uh, power. The other thing is that instead of let's have people come on Medicare if they've lost their job, we have 30 million people who have lost their jobs, uh, tens of million people, you know, or almost 10 million people have lost their health insurance that were tied into their employment. Some have gone into Medicaid, but these other people need to be dealt with. You could just have them come right into Medicare. You could have them come into Medicaid for that matter. They promoted the, the subsidizing of COBRA, which if you're worried about money on one hand that you can't have economic stabilizers in there saying that these programs are not going to run out until, right. until certain thresholds are met, how do you turn around and then pay for the single most expensive form of health insurance maybe created in the history of man? I mean, literally, there's no other way to pay more for health insurance than to subsidize COBRA from a government or frankly, from an individual. That's a, a, one of the big problems I have. And the other problem is, and there were many people saying this contemporaneously. I had a couple on this show. When they passed the CARES Act, that was the only time there was leverage. The Republicans wanted that trillions of dollars of backstop from the Fed. They wanted the corporate money to go out there. There was nothing else on the, uh, on the, uh, the Republican wish list. And I mean, so much so that they had to manufacture this whole like corporate in, in, in indemnity, which there hasn't been a rash of suits against corporations. That's not that I really think that's sort of kabuki. But this is her job. She has one job because she cannot force anything through a Republican Senate. The only thing that she can do is to assess where is the leverage that the Democrats have and use that leverage to get things that are absolutely crucial and assess whether the Republicans down the road are gonna give it. We are looking at such a massive crisis now with cities and states in particular. It's all going to happen and the Republicans are going to do nothing about it. They're gonna do nothing about it. And it's gonna inhibit Joe Biden's attempt to even get elected, I think, on some level because of what they're doing to blue states. There's no money for, for voter protection. There was one opportunity, one bite at the apple, and she was so indignant when people brought this up that we have video. Let's play this video, and then I want you to address both these issues. This is, again, this is her with Jake Tapper. This was indicative of what she was saying even a month after the CARES Act uh, was passed. Let's play this clip. Right. You and Senator Schumer made this major concession on the most recent legislation uh, because you, you it wasn't made a it concession. okay. Oh, and pause it. I'm sorry. The and pause it. This was when they came back for the second bite at the Paycheck Protection Program, which is a, a program that, that uh, allowed for small businesses to get extended paychecks. The Republicans wanted this as well. 
Nancy Pelosi is going to brag about getting an extra $100 billion for it. I got news for you. There's $150 billion sitting unused in that right now. That money was, there was no projection that that money was needed because you only have one bite at the apple. There's only so many businesses out there. So they came in, they did it in a day. You need this, Republicans? We're going to say a little bit more. We're going to give you a little bit more of what you already want, but we're not going to use the leverage we have. And here's, here's how she's addressing. Um, and, and this is Jake Tapper who sees this problem. Right. You and Senator Schumer made this major concession on the most recent legislation uh, because you, you it made it okay so in this yeah. one. for the, It wasn't a concession. No. Well, I mean, here, Governor the, the, Andrew Cuomo, let me... The, the, I understand what Andrew Cuomo said, and I, I respect his perspective as a governor, but the fact is this. They wanted 250 for the PPP. We support the PPP. We're part of developing it. Uh, small business is entrepreneurial, part of the uh, uh, optimism of America. So we're for that. But we wanted to include more people and more money for the program and for the hospital. So it was an, right, always no, I, an interim I, bill. It was always an interim bill. We always said that Seek, uh, CARES 2 would be the bill where we would go to, uh, for state and local. Right. And we will I, in a big I, way. I, 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 I get that, but I just want to play for you the sound from New York Governor Cuomo because he said he needs money for his state to save New York from an economic tsunami. Uh, take a listen to what yes. he had to say. We've been talking about funding for state and local governments, and it was not in the bill that the House is going to pass today. They said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, the next bill. I said to my colleagues in Washington, I would have insisted that state and local funding was in this current bill. Because I don't believe they want to fund state and local governments. So Cuomo says he would have insisted on state funding uh, in the last bill. You, you, and now Senator McConnell is saying he wants to push the pause button. Uh, yes. Was this a tactical mistake by you and Senator Schumer? Just calm down. We will have state and local, and we will have it in a very significant way. Uh, it's no use going on to what might have been the administration never even wanted to do. Let me recap this for you. When we said we're not okay, doing you don't 250. Need to hear anymore. Um, All right, there it is. Andrew Cuomo clearly understood what was going on in Washington, D.C. There were other people who had been saying that since CARES 1. CARES 2, incidentally, never happened. That clip is from four and a half months ago. And we're not going to not only is it not going to happen tomorrow, it's not going to happen next month. It's not going to happen the month after. It's not going to happen during this is the best case scenario. It's not going to happen during the lame duck period. This is assuming that Joe Biden wins. The earliest we're going to see this. Any support, a dollar for cities or states is going to be sometime in March of 2020. That's the earliest possible, because not only do you have to go through the House with this city and state stuff, you're going to have to go through a Senate, which is at the very least is going to filibuster it. So then you got to convince Chris Coons to get rid of the filibuster. And then you got to go back again and you got to get the thing passed. And that dollar's going to get out the door. We're not going to see this until March, almost a year after she said these words. Best case scenario. So, and, and Shahid, I, I, I got to let you speak. I'm sorry, but this gets me so. Speak on, brother. <laughs> that uh, you're obviously not going to be Speaker of the House. But if you get elected, Nancy Pelosi will not be Speaker of the House. And I don't care if it's Paul Ryan who gets in there because Paul Ryan doesn't have the ability to shut down debate like she did over the past six months over this thing because she do, he doesn't have the institutional. She's been there for decades. She was, you know, uh, over 15 years ago was the Speaker of the House. So I would rather someone who's weaker in terms of their ability to maintain their own power, uh, even if they don't agree with me, because we're cities and states are going to be destroy and that's going to impact millions of people living in poverty homelessness it's going to it's going to impact food security it's going to impact health insurance it's going to we i mean education teachers unions i mean the, the we're we're looking at a tsunami here it seems to me it is catastrophic 
and it's needlessly catastrophic. And you're absolutely right in drawing attention to what I describe as one of the core rationales for our campaign, and that is to ensure that Nancy Pelosi is not the Speaker of the House in the next session of Congress. And the failures of the House and the House leadership with her holding the gavel, I dare say, are inexcusable. And you've noted some of them. It's just to, to note here, the, there are two different points at which Nancy Pelosi in the last several months has just profoundly conceded any authority and influence to the right wing. The first of them, you noted, and that was the passage of the first stimulus bill, giving away more or less everything that the GOP wanted without insisting on anything that our communities needed. The second was the more recent CR. And this idea that somehow Nancy Pelosi- That's a is continuing called. resolution that allows the government to open. She has made an agreement with Mnuchin to just do a clean, we'll keep the government open. No stimulus, no rent and mortgage relief, no UBI, no support for state and local governments, none of that stuff, right? And the idea, she gets a lot of credit from people, you know, centrist liberals who think that she's strong because she tears up a speech or claps sideways. But the voting record, the policy record suggests- that the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, the most powerful Democrat in Washington, is Donald Trump's greatest enabler on Capitol Hill. And I've known this. I've watched it. I've watched Nancy Pelosi's active complicity in the authoritarianism that has emerged in the last 20 years. I'm very aware of the poignance of today's anniversary and, and, and how it indicates her long-running complicity. But, and, and for instance, the color of the sky in San Francisco this week and the issues that it presents. But just to stay focused on the coronavirus stimulus packages, in addition to the state and local governments, which you're absolutely right to focus on, they are more or less the source of the greatest support that working families and Americans can get because our federal social services layer has so eroded under the generation of policymakers of, of whom Nancy Pelosi is a part, not only are the state and local governments facing preventable crises, but I really want to focus on the struggling local people and communities. There is an eviction wave that's been building and accelerating across the country. Many states have had measures in place like um, an eviction moratorium, which we've had here in San Francisco or in California across the state, but they're not indefinite. And it would have been great if one of the early coronavirus stimulus measures ensured that millions of Americans who are struggling to put food on the table wouldn't have to worry about putting put in the street because the economy had to be shut down in order to guard public health. But that's not what happened. In fact, in the early coronavirus stimulus measures, what did get included, and this is very revealing, are tax breaks for millionaires. Nancy Pelosi prioritized tax breaks of $1.6 million each for tax filers who earn over a million dollars a year and there's not a penny of rent or mortgage relief. And there's a bill on the table that would keep millions of people in their homes, that would allow people to sleep at night, who I think their anxieties on top of their everything else might be difficult to deal with. Um, and those weren't prioritized. I see similarly UBI. Uh, I noticed an article this morning that France recently decided to extend its support program, direct cash payments to residents through the summer of 2021, and in the United States, we've had two one-time payments of $1,200 for some tax filers, most of whom haven't gotten it. The PPP, which Nancy Pelosi was bragging about on that clip, her own husband was a beneficiary. He's a part owner of a hotel in Northern California. Her own husband got a PPP loan for his business worth over a million dollars. And I've talked to small business owners who haven't been able to navigate the Byzantine process to gain access to it. So even the PPP, was, which, which as you noted, has unspent funds, was something of a racket. And she's talking about the optimism of America. The optimism of America is making sure that people can get medicine if they're sick. That's what you show up for if you care about optimism in America or making sure that we don't have a sky that's poisonous to literally millions of people who live up and down the West Coast. That would, that would support the optimism in America. And my favorite part of the clip that you shared is where Nancy Pelosi says, well, there's no point in debating what could have been. And with all due respect to the speaker, we live in a democracy and there's a great deal of point in assessing what might have been because even if she doesn't seem to realize it, she's accountable to the residents of San Francisco and she faces a Democrat in the November election for the first time in her career during which, incidentally, she has never, not once, shown up for a debate against a challenger. It's been 30 years since she went to the, to the House. She's never debated a challenger. And she says there's no point to looking at her record. I respectfully, but also emphatically, would beg to differ. There's a great deal of points to looking at the record of incumbents. It's called democracy, and the Speaker might want to get acquainted with it.
and I'm, I'm eager to acquaint her with it in a few months. I just want to clarify for, some, for, for something for people who don't understand how California works. California has what is known, I guess, as a jungle primary, where uh, there is um, it, it, it is not based upon parties. Everybody goes in there and the top two vote getters end up meeting in the general election. So you have instances, theoretically, you could have a Republican running against a Republican in a general election. You could have a Republican versus a uh, Democrat. And in this instance, we have two Democrats running. So there, this is not, there is no, just want to make it clear. There's no spoiler situation here. There's no, uh, the, the, none of that is a question. There is going to be a Democrat who is going to be sitting as a congressperson from the 12th district of California. The question is, is it going to be you or Pelosi? And, 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 and again, I also just want to remind people, because I know there's some people out there like, what about the Republicans? Yes, the Republicans are not going to pass anything except for unless you have what they want, which had already been given away. And it's really the second time. Like you say, the continuing resolution, I guess people can debate as to who's going to take more of the blame uh, if the government doesn't go forward. But it seems to me that there is at least a, uh, there should be a debate as to whether it is powerful for the Democrats to say, we need to provide for the American public and nothing goes forward without that. You don't have the ability to degrade the Department of Justice. You don't have the ability to degrade OSHA. You don't have the ability to send our kids back to school without the protections for teachers that are needed. You don't have the, the, uh, the ability to, um, you know, go on and on. I mean, we, it's very easy to develop this rhetoric. Uh, and we're not going to stand for it until you fund these things to help the American public, just because you think that Joe Biden's going to be president and you're going to already start the obstruction now. That's not going to happen. We're not going to participate in that. There is, a, there is a game that Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are playing. And that is, how do we thread this needle? How do we at once not empower Donald Trump to uh, help the American public and get credit for it and hurt our chances of beating him in the election, which, you know, I think there is an argument that the most important thing that Donald Trump loses because it's going to be a crap show if he gets another four years. I think there's some valid arguments to that. Clearly. But instead of using all their resources to do that, they also protect their other flank, which says, how do we do that without promising stuff that would inhibit, would go contrary to what our corporate benefactors want in the event that we're in a position to deliver it. Yeah, so yeah. that's why you get things like subsidized COBRA, which is not a benefit for the American public. It's not fiscally uh, responsible. It is a way of saying that we're doing something, but it's not in any way holding us to any type of promise that we're actually going to do something that's going to fundamentally help the American public after the fact. I mean, so even if we put aside the fact that she didn't use leverage when she had it, that, that just strategically and tactically, she failed. Put aside her ideology, she failed in that regard. Then there's this, this other game where she's basically not using all of the feathers in the, the, the arrows in the quiver because she's afraid that those arrows run contrary to the interests of some of her corporate benefactors. And we may actually have to deploy those arrows if Joe Biden wins. And the, that the is I, reprehensible. The place it, where I see that dynamic you're describing, leaving cards on the table to support corporate benefactors, where I see that get most poignant was before all this, before the pandemic even started, it was in the impeachment process where we could have included corruption Mm -hmm. That would have brought the president down. Corruption offends Americans across the political spectrum, unlike the partisan crime that she chose to limit the process to, right? Corruption could have brought down the president. She affirmatively removed it from the objects of consideration. Jerry Nadler, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, has made this point himself publicly. It was Nancy Pelosi who said that Trump will not be forced to answer for his corruption. And that is another example of you know, taking a very important argument off the table, basically because it placed corporate Democrats and their corporate benefactors at political risk. And the idea that the political risk to corporate benefactors or industries or corporate Democrats for that matter, should outweigh the dire existential crises facing our country is frankly preposterous. And it's not like there's just one crisis. 
right? It's not like there's just a climate catastrophe unfolding or just a global pandemic or just an economic collapse. I mean, there's a, there is, I saw a study this week about the rates of suicide ideation among young people, something like one in four people below the age of 30 has seriously considered taking their life in the last six months. And that, it, that, that's, it's, that's amazing. And an amazing demonstration of failure. We cannot allow policies that drive entire generations to think about taking themselves to early graves. It, it just seems so preposterous to me that anyone would consider the status quo is viable or tenable or sustainable given reflections like that. And the failures of leadership here have been up and down the line. You know, to your point about the, you know, the strategic and tactical failure and then the ideological co-optation, I would maybe describe as that second point that you're raising, corporate Democrats led by Nancy Pelosi fight the left and working American families struggling with the cost of this pandemic far harder than they've ever fought the president. They'll, they'll theatrically resist the president while paving his path in policy. And we, the people of the United States, trying to get medicine in the middle of a pandemic or trying to stay in our homes while the economy is shut down, Congress, led by Nancy Pelosi, basically gave America the middle finger because they're more interested in looking out for themselves. And again, those industries that they protect. One yeah, industry, yeah. just to bring it into the mix, because it's, it's hard for me not to think about this today, is the defense industry, so-called defense industry. And, and the anniversary of today seems to, to bring into place. So, and that's one of the, for me, existential, not just reasons for my campaign, but even why I'm an American. You know, my family fled the impacts of the US military industrial complex on democracies abroad. The democracy in my native country was repeatedly toppled by military coups supported by the United States. And it was, it was those military governments that my family fled going to England in the 60s. And then my family came to the US in the 70s. I wouldn't be an American if it weren't for the serial crimes of our military industrial complex. And that also have been driven by these industrial interests. You know, Eisenhower put it in those terms when he forecast what ultimately came to be. So I'm just bringing that. And then maybe the other industry to put on the table here is all the ones related to fossil fuel extraction. The corporate Democrats are owned by industry. And it's why we call them corporate Democrats. And, and they're policies reflected. And the idea that we are forced to choose at a time like this between outright unrepentant fascists and people who put corporate interests before our communities, it, one reason that's so dangerous is that fascism supports the market. That role of corporate Democrats paves the road for fascism. Because to your point, if we don't have alternative voices saying to people, and this is one reason I supported Senator Sanders for the presidency, if we don't have alternative voices that are actually meeting people where we are at and meeting their needs, populations and electorates become very susceptible to the allure of right-wing populism because it preys on dejection, it preys on fear and anxiety, it preys on insufficiency, it preys on crisis. And because corporate Democrats have done nothing, nothing, to actually address the real crises confronting our people, it primes the pump for Trump and his criminal ilk. And as much as I fear this president, you know, I fear what he has unleashed far more. And what he has unleashed, I fear, will be the defining characteristic of our generation. Our generation's project is to put that genie back in the bottle and reassert a vision of America that includes all people, that has respect for workers, that has respect for minorities, that that doesn't degrade uh, you know, other countries as, you know, I mean, I can't even repeat the president's terms. It's just so vile right. what we see in Washington today and we can't take it. And we can't take the actors who claim falsely to resist it while tacitly, and in some cases, too many cases in the, in the example of corporate Democrats, actively supporting the policy paradigm. You know, uh, there was, um... That that performative aspect. The the other day, Nancy Pelosi tweeted out uh, something to the effect of the president, "You lied and people died." All well, I remember I mean, that. True, true. And I just added a link to that interview with uh, Jake Tapper because that to me was just you know indicative of both of both how indignant she was about the criticism she was getting. It pointed out that there was criticism that was contemporaneous that people could predict how the Republican Party was going to act and, and, and could assess what their agenda was. Yep. 
And it also indicates her either disingenuousness or cluelessness as to how this was all going to play out. And I don't know which one it was, and it really doesn't matter. Same. Um, but the performative is not enough. And for people who criticize me by saying, like, you're doing both sides-ism, and the most important thing is to get rid of Donald Trump. I agree the most important thing is to do, get rid of Donald Trump. There is not a single voter in the country who is contemplating switching from Donald, supporting Donald Trump to uh, supporting Joe Biden, who is going to listen to Nancy Pelosi, with all due respect. Nancy Pelosi has allowed herself to become villainized by the Republican Party because it strengthens her support within the Democratic Party. This is a very obvious technique that anybody who is a YouTuber up to, you know, like, uh, I don't know, a, a despot uh, understands that you, you know, having an outside enemy uh, rallies people around you and it is not helping the Democratic Party win. She is maintaining her own power. And things like if you're challenging a, a sitting Democrat in the House, you are blacklisted. But I will support Joe Kennedy yes. going against Ed Markey. And why? Because Ed Markey joined AOC in supporting the Green New Deal, which she is fundamentally against. People can remember those first month in, uh, in 2018 when the Democrats swept into power and Nancy Pelosi fought tooth and nail to make sure there was no talk of Green New Deal. She made sure there was no talk of Medicare for all. None of these things, which poll after poll, you had Stanley Greenberg, who is a longtime Democratic pollster, not an ideologue, not a leftist in any, in any measurable way, just like a straight down the middle a Democrat who's basically done poll after poll, focus group after focus group, which show if you want to win, you offer health care in a meaningful way. And now all you got to do is look to the north if you're in San Francisco and you see a blood red sky. And the idea that the Democrats do not have a fully articulated vision of health care, not just for the 10 million people who are eligible to go into the ACA exchanges around the country, but for every American in the country to make it cheaper for them. And they don't have a fully articulated vision a comprehensive one, which where they're all on the same page, where they can point to the, the sky in the north of California and say, see that blood red sky? That is the new norm, and we need to do something about it. The fact that we are absent of that at this time may not preclude us from defeating the, one of the most hated presidents in the history of the country. But when 2022 rolls around and when 2024 rolls around, we could be looking at President Tom Cotton. We could be looking at a, a Republican uh, Senate and House. I mean, to it's not enough to every four years get a couple of years worth of, uh, of ability to create legislature because we've now seen what happened to Obama's accomplishments to the extent that they were. You need to have a durable victory. And to have a durable victory, you need to actually provide stuff that the the public wants. And that is not inconsistent with defeating what I consider to be one of the greatest threats to the country that we, that certainly been alive in my, in my lifetime. And I lived through Nixon for God's sakes. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I'm with you. I mean, this, this point about the, the need to remove Donald Trump from the white house, precluding any attention to the further things we need to do is, is frankly silly. We do need to remove Donald Trump from the White House. And if we mean seriously to address any of our crises, we have to also change some people in Congress. It's not and enough. They're not mutually exclusive ideas. In exactly. fact, they work with each other. Precisely. To your point, if we showed up for the policies supported by a majority of the American people, like Medicare for all, that would help the Democratic nominee win the race. There's a reason that Senator Sanders was supported so widely. If you look, there's a map that the New York Times used to publish that showed the who was the leading fundraiser among the presidential candidates in each part of the country. And it, it revealed that by far, Bernie was the most supported candidate. And you might say that that suggests interesting, maybe hypocritical things about a party that calls itself democratic while nominating a nominee with demonstrably less support. And, you know, yes, we could chalk that up to the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party. Yes, we could talk about how that places the American people and our entire democracy at risk. 
given who's in the White House and his aspirations to implement his own form of not constitutional government. Uh, but beyond all that, you know, I just see this abdication of the need to represent the people. Theoretically, legislators are representatives. They are there to represent us. And what corporate Democrats have not done at all is that. And I think to your point, uh, it, it not only places the race to remove Trump at risk by failing to meet people where they're at and conceding this ground of outrage and concern to right-wing populists who claim, at least, even if they don't, in fact, stand in solidarity with working people. This is the allure of right-wing populism under an age of corporate rule. Because people are actually struggling with real crises, they want to throw the bums out. And when you have oligarchs and tyrants present themselves as outsiders. That's exactly what Donald Trump did. It's very dangerous because people want outsiders because they recognize that the insiders have been fleecing us yes. for decades. And Nancy Pelosi has been part of that. You know, the, when you talk about the blood red sky in San Francisco, one thing I think that's really important to note is that the environmental crises here long preceded this week. They long preceded the, the drought that sparked wildfires in the last several years. Hunter's Point is a neighborhood here in San Francisco. It's in the southeastern corner of the city. It's one of our last remaining black enclaves. And it's been poisoned by the US Navy for decades. It's the site where they built the nuclear bombs that were tested in the South Pacific uh, before the use of weapons of mass destruction in Hiroshima and Nagasaki by the US military. So before we committed mass atrocities, we were testing these bombs in the South Pacific and we were poisoning an entire neighborhood across San Francisco where the breast cancer rates and the asthma rates are among the worst in the world. And that was long before the sky turned red. And the idea that the political establishment in Washington is able to ignore these issues of public health and environmental racism, to me, it's really poignant because the Speaker of the House represents this city and these issues around environmental racism and justice and toxicity and public health, they've been there for decades. And it would be great if Hunter's Point had a powerful member of Congress to do something about it, but our very powerful members of, member of Congress from San Francisco, at least, has had other priorities like passing tax breaks for Right. Millionaires. Let's get the, the salt uh, deductions back on uh, the, you know, I mean, and just to be clear on what those salt deductions are, they are for uh, wealthy people who uh, were able to deduct their, because um, they own a very maybe expensive house, like maybe in San Francisco, um, I can deduct my, um, my property taxes from my federal taxes. This is a tax deduction that goes, I think, 60 to 80% of it go to people who are making, I think, over a million dollars or somewhere around there or have uh, over a million dollars worth of wealth. And that was a huge issue. Um, and, and I understand, you know, the, the argument that uh, it precludes, um, you know, blue states from taxing, but I don't, I don't think there's any data to support that, frankly. Uh, but, but I understand that argument. But, you know, the, the bottom line, it's just a question of priorities. And here, let me give one more example before we go to the break into the fun half. I make the argument that Nancy Pelosi can set markers that can actually help people, even though the Republicans aren't going to pass it. And she won't do that because she is co-opted by, like you say, uh, ideological and corporate interests and does not want to set a marker and create, this is called managing expectations. Sure. We want to make sure that the Democratic Party, that you, the Democratic voter, do not expect your own party to deliver what you want them to deliver. And so instead of, I don't know, a Medicare buy-in. We're going to subsidize your coming into Medicare, which would be far more fiscally responsible than we're going to subsidize the most expensive uh, insurance product there is, COBRA, and we're going to just, all the money is just going to go into the insurance industry. There was a vote in the Senate on what the uh, they call the skinny um, uh, coronavirus relief. It was a crappy little bill that uh, the Democrats uh, were right to reject. I don't even think the Republicans were terribly interested in it passing anyways. They just want to be able to say they brought up something. And this kabuki theater that they have around corporate indemnification for any lawsuits so that they can open up their, uh, whatever it is, their businesses and not get sued by people because they did so in a way that endangered their workers and their customers. What this means for work, essential workers is scandalous and no one's talking about it. I'm so, so glad you're raising this because behind the corporate in, indemnification 
is basically carte blanche to not only abuse workers, but place public health at risk. I mean, I think about the meatpacking plants in particular, where these we've had these outbreaks. And this is, it's not just a right-wing corporate subsidy. It's a corporate subsidy that invites predictable public health crises as if we don't have enough already. Well, we want to talk about a profile in courage. Nancy Pelosi can't come out and say that she's for any type of expansion of health care. But Chris Coons, the number one surrogate for Joe Biden, not just in the Senate, he was anytime I was on MSNBC and they needed a uh, they needed a spoke and Biden wasn't available. They had the other candidates and have Biden. They would bring Chris Coons on. He was a group. Uh, this is according to the. Um, a uh, real sludge, actually. dot com. Uh, Coons was a, um, and he, honed, he I guess he holds Joe Biden's former Senate seat. Was among a small group of Democrats in May that called for corporate immunity, which the Hill described as a crack in Democratic unity that gives Republicans in the White House some leverage. Uh, Coons said he wanted liability protections for businesses included in the next coronavirus bill, along with health and safety guidelines for businesses that would be required to follow. The simplest and most powerful solution to liability protection is to have a science based blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, liability protection, you know what the way to, you, you, you know, if you're worried about that, then you have uh, the liability adjudicated in the courts. Um, but the big thing for him is he has a big uh, he has a big hedge fund who are big supporters of his who own a lot of um, nursing homes, and the nursing nursing home industry is rightfully very concerned that they have been cutting corners for an extended period of time, for the health and safety of their um, of their of their uh, clients, their customers, yeah, and their customers and, and their families uh, and their families and a lot of people died in nursing homes probably the primary source of the deaths in this country uh, and, and including uh, I would imagine the workers at these things. Uh, so here is uh, Chris Coons who is uh, basically pushing this Republican initiative and he's willing to come out and do it and suffer the slings and arrows. It does not make sense. There is no, there is no way that Chris Coons is running on this. The Democrats have at their disposal a lot of things they could bring out. They are just afraid to do it because they don't want to set a marker. But somehow Chris Coons manages to set that marker for himself going into this election. It gives you a sense that at the very least, you're being played by this. And that's not to say that Democrats are as bad as Republicans because there are Democrats who are arguing against Nancy Pelosi. There's a Democrat sitting right there running against Nancy Pelosi who disagrees with her fundamentally on all these issues. But it is to say that the Democratic Party, there are elements of the Democratic Party that are preventing and are there to prevent the real change that would empower Democrats for generations in a way that we saw after Social Security, in a way that we saw after things like Medicare. Um, there are Democrats who are preventing this because their maintenance of power is primary. And the maintenance of power by Democrats and Democrats standing as a party that provides for people what they want and need is secondary to them maybe even tertiary. I don't know what comes in between, but um, uh, Shahid, we're going to take a break. Yep. We're going to go into the fun half where I will be less strident and I will allow you to talk more. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, we will uh, go through some of the uh, clips of uh, the insanity that's going on and talk a little bit about um, – the insanity that I anticipate happening, and we're starting to see it from now until the election, and then perhaps the one afterwards. I should just tell people, I interviewed David Dayen on uh, Ring of Fire this week. He has an amazing piece called The Winter of Our Discontent, talking about the next 78 days, or I should say the 78 days starting from the election to uh, the inauguration. I cannot encourage you uh, to uh, read that piece enough and to listen to the Ring of Fire interview with David Dayen. Uh, we're going to have him on this program probably at the beginning of October to talk about the same thing because it is so important that people are aware of what is going to take place, not definitely, but more than likely, and we can talk a little bit about this on the other side, 
this election, and we're seeing it yesterday where the Wisconsin State Supreme Court basically said, we're going to hold up on the absentee ballots because uh, there's some question here. It's a conservative court. It was a conservative decision. They're going to hold up on the absentee ballots, which is going to have a ripple effect. So when those ballots don't come in on time, they're going to say, well, you know, it's not our fault, but it will be because they are sent out late. That is just the beginning, and it's the most benign version of what we're going to see, I believe, starting close to election day, in terms of shutting down the counting in different places, different courts shutting stuff down, Bill Barr activating, I have the Proud Boys, I think like the whole kit and caboodle. And it's very important, very important that every single person who uh, is invested in the outcome of this election be aware of what could possibly happen and what could be required of people. Because we're going to have to get into the streets. We're going to have to be aware and, bro and make people aware of what's going on with the courts, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, this is going to be ugly. I, I, I'm convinced of it. Um, but uh, check out that interview with uh, David Dayan on Ring of Fire. If you want to support this program, you can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, check out the AM Quickie, six, seven minutes of, uh, of headline news in the morning. Uh, totally free. You can find that at amquickie.com or any of your podcast uh, descriptions. Uh, don't forget, check out uh, Nomiki's show. She is uh, now going five days a week, four days a week. Right after the show at 3 p.m., check that out. Uh, Jamie, what's happening on the Antifada? Hey. So this week on the Antifada, we had on Brace Belden of the True Anon podcast to talk about the history of labor organizing in the United States, um, the role played by communists in the militant labor movement, and what people can do now to bring some of that power back, um, the idea of the party, what is a workers party, what kind of organization do we need to be building, et cetera, et cetera. That went out on Wednesday for everyone. And then today we released a bonus where uh, Brace and the guys talk a little bit about punk rock and what they like to listen to growing up as uh, young punks. So that's out now, patreon.com slash the Antifada. Also, I should say, I went on the No Me Key show yesterday to talk about socialist feminism. We had a little panel discussion on it, and that is still up now for anyone who wants to watch it. Check that out. Matt, what's happening on TMBS? Yeah, TMBS this Tuesday, we had Milton Alamadi of Black Star News. We talked about the coup in Mali, and then uh, Uganda's Museveni is sort of like the uh, prototypical uh, imperial puppet and uh, his sort of Trump-like attacks on his opponent in that election, Bobby Wine. He's saying he's actually 40 when he's, or he's saying he's actually 40 when he claims he's 38. So that's the sort of level of politics that he's engaging in. So yeah, patreon.com slash TMBS and then twitch.tv slash literary hangover. I'm playing Flight Simulator. So uh, probably do that this weekend. Okay, great. Uh, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. You can get the Majority Report blend. See you in the fun half, 646-257-3920. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Ooh. Grandpa. I had my first post 
coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. <laughs> I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. I think I might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way. Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's. I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the majority report. Sam will be with you shortly. Uh, let's start with a little bit of uh, of Donald Trump uh, lying, shall we? Um, <laughs> Can I just say that that video was amazing? That video is amazing. I, I, I've that. probably watched that video now, mm, I, I think, a thousand times. I mean, maybe, <laughs> like, honestly, like, how long have we been playing that, Matt? Uh, a couple of years, so probably a hundred times probably oh. watched it. <laughs> It really rewards no, no, no. repeated viewings. You've been playing it for a couple of times. We a do couple hundred. 50 shows a year. So yeah. it's conceivable. I've watched that like maybe uh, the three, 300 times. And I still see things in it that I never saw before. Uh, that Sign of good art. was done by Bullprog. And they, um, I, I still don't understand how they did it. It's all just audio snippets that they then... I don't know if they started with the audio snippets or they had some conception of what was going. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a work of art. It's a work of art. Um, all right. So let's start with Donald Trump lying and then we'll go into uh, uh, Ben Shapiro covering for Donald Trump lying. Oddly enough, two separate lies. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, here is Donald Trump. Um, he does. He just sort of talks a uh, uh, a, uh, a sort of a small lie when it comes to Social Security and an incredibly stunning lie when it comes to pre-existing conditions. Here is uh, Donald Trump at, uh, and is this at the, oh, this is the Michigan rally. We should also say the, uh, a New York Times reporter was kicked out of this rally because she was taking pictures and tweeting out and a significant portion of these people were not wearing masks uh, at this rally. But continue. Why would they? Free government health care to illegal aliens. He will destroy your social security. He will destroy your protections for pre-existing conditions. And we will save social security. Remember they said last time, oh, Trump is going to destroy social security. Well, it's now four years. We haven't touched it. We protected it. And that's going to remain that way. So there is Donald Trump sort of trying to get to the left of Joe Biden on Social Security. Now, we should say that his budget did, uh, 2020 budget did call for cuts on Social Security. It didn't go anywhere. The budget didn't go anywhere. Uh, they, I have in my hand, actually, a letter that was sent to uh, federal workers uh, saying that their um, payroll tax will be deferred. Donald Trump has talked about doing this for everybody. And, and then basically um, uh, wiping it clean if he gets elected. Well, that's the funding, the, the sole mechanism of funding for Social Security. If there's no money, then there's no Social Security. Uh, Joe Biden has not only not said that he would cut Social Security, but the Senate, the last Democratic uh, Senate uh, caucus is on record as wanting to expand Social Security again, expectation created. That's why we're going to hold them to it. Um, and 
uh, the pre-existing conditions, not only does Joe Biden want to expand the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, insufficient but necessary, which is where the whole concept of protecting pre-existing conditions comes from, Donald Trump's administration right now is in federal court trying to scrap the ACA, which would scrap pre-existing conditions. Um, and the like, this is stuff that would ruin a campaign 10 years ago. Mm. Well, and now nothing. I guess he's playing to his base here, right? Because uh, those are the only people who believe every ridiculous thing that he says, a hook, line, and sinker, right? Like, uh, this is not even some obscure lie that you need a CNN fact checker to discover, right? Because literally the one thing that people know and like about Obamacare is the pre-existing conditions part, right? The, the patient protection, yes. I, I fear here, though, that the people actually don't grip anything. Yep. You know, the, the degree to which Americans, frankly, manage not to pay attention to these debates that impact our lives very emphatically it amazes me. Uh, it, it, and I, it's frankly irrational. But I, it, I do fear that because the president, however much he's lying, is dressing himself. This is what I was talking about before with the allure of right wing populism in a time of crisis. He's wrapping himself in rhetoric, suggesting that he understands the plight of struggling people, even though his policy record demonstrably establishes that he has been vicious with respect to the rights of struggling people. But because corporate Democrats haven't shown up, confused Americans who pay attention, you know, with barely an iota of attention or focus can actually be and have been in entirely too many cases gullibly hoodwinked by this charlatan. And the, it's one reason why a meaningful alternative to his snake oil is the most credible and, and, and effective way of dispelling it. But that's, of course, what corporate Democrats blocked by coalescing their presidential nomination field against Bernie Sanders. That's why Bernie beats Trump, because it takes off the table this craven political attempt by Trump to disown his own legacy and to wrap himself. I mean, Nancy Pelosi does the same thing. They, they have both, in rhetoric, tried to disown their own records. And that's a clear sign that a politician is up to no good. When they, when they can't own up to their record. And the fact that Democrats can't force him to own up to his record is problematic because they nominated somebody who, frankly, has so much space on his left in Joe Biden that it opens the opportunity for this criminal president to, to play this, this card. And, and we all know that he's lying through his teeth, but I fear that entirely too many Americans don't. I, I agree with you. And this is, the, this, is the, this is the dilemma that the Democrats have, right? Is that Donald Trump can get out there and he can lie, bald-faced lie, I mean, just 180 degrees. Um, and he can do that, A, because he's not shameless, and B, nobody in the party cares. There's no, there's no wing of the party that is really like, hey, wait a second, we're going to hold you to this. Uh, because there is no sort of institutional, within the party structure, within the right, there is nobody out there who's going like, he just put down the marker. We're going to keep, um, you know, we're going to keep uh, those, you know, protections and we're not going to cut Social Security. That's not going to happen. Yeah. The Democrats have another uh, have a dilemma, which is why it is not enough for them. And, and, and the dilemma is this, oddly enough, is that Nancy Pelosi can go out and say we're going to protect, um, you know, uh, pre-existing conditions. But Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden can't outflank uh, Trump here because there is a cohort within the Democratic Party that will hold them to that. And that's what, you know, I'm talking about with this Cobra thing. And so they have to sort of hedge a little bit. And that gives some running room for Trump. Now, I happen to believe that Joe Biden is going to beat Donald Trump. And I, I think that I, I still strongly believe that Martin O'Malley would have won in 2016. I think Hillary Clinton was uniquely ill-suited to uh, to win that election and and still lost it by a sliver, but the durability of this win with, to, to really get a, to, to fix the country, you need to have power for an extended period of time. And it's not just enough to have a popular president for eight years. You need the house, you need the Congress, you need a, a significant number of states, uh, a power within the states, which uh, Obama could not maintain because they were they are fighting a two front war, 
And that two front war is one, they're fighting the Republicans and two, they're fighting any sort of like meaningful change that will inhibit the corporate power structure in this country. And, you know, the ultimately it's not going to happen with Joe Biden. Uh, but ultimately, there has to be power. In, and right now, the House, and one of the reasons, frankly, Shahid, that I want you to win, it's not just because Nancy Pelosi will not be uh, the Speaker of the House, but because there is a growing um, group of, of, of lawmakers in the House who are younger, they're of a different generation, they have a different perspective on not just ideological perspective, but they also have a different perspective on just pure partisan politics. And they, you know, AOC, I genuinely, uh, I, obviously I appreciate her from an ideological perspective, but she is also the type of Democrat that Democrats have been calling for for years, which is one that will fight and will use every advantage they have and won't be inhibited by interests that want to preclude them from moving forward and beating Republicans. At least on many issues. I mean, one area, and I'm not here aiming to put my elbows out, I'll just note <clears throat> one way in which the squad has disappointingly not used all of its influence. You mentioned before Nancy Pelosi's endorsement of Joe Kennedy over Ed Markey, despite her previous commitment to protect incumbents. And in that decision, she not only violated her own commitment that she'd enforced on other people, but she also undermined climate justice. She privileged dynastic politics over democracy, lots of things we might say there. But she particularly indicated to the rest of the caucus that it's politically safe to endorse against incumbents. And, you know, I certainly uh, have, have said before that I'm happy to, to win this race on our own without support from the allies who I hope to empower in Congress. If those folks really want to empower their agenda, one thing they might do is endorse a candidate, the first in a generation poised to remove their central antagonist in the House. And one reason it's tough for them, frankly, is because Nancy Pelosi- Transactionally. Right, exactly. <laughs> they will never get a committee uh, position. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and this is, I mean, that is it. that dynamic is a problem. People can see how this works right there. Is Though I, to, to connect the dots with our prior thing that Jamie raised a minute ago, I don't think people do connect the dots. I think entirely too many Americans have no idea that Nancy Pelosi suppresses the voices, not just of left-wing members of Congress, but inhibits left-wing members from coming to Congress by turning screws on the people who are there to keep them quiet about their own values as they're implicated in other races. Oh, without a doubt. I, I, without a doubt. And, and, and I mean, I... You don't have to believe me. You don't have to sell me on the ignorance of uh, the voting public. That's that's uh, um, I'm on. I'm, I'm still on chapter, I think, like uh, eight of my blame the voters um, uh, book. I haven't I haven't found a publisher yet for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I haven't written in it yet either, but yeah, someday, someday it will. <laughs> um, here is uh, let's talk about Ben Shapiro for a minute. This is impressive because do we do we have the uh, the the let's play the Bob Woodward uh, audio, the one where, where Trump said because this it really is I mean I I I can't imagine that there's many people out there who give uh, Donald Trump uh, less benefit of the doubt, uh, but this so poignantly captures like resolves that evil or stupid. Uh, debate that we have about Donald Trump, because I thought it was very possible, like, look, the guy's a lunatic. He's, uh, you know, I don't know, untreated syphilis, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, he watches uh, own and they tell him something about the, the China virus and he believes it and that's it. And uh, but here he is. Let's play this and then let's play Ben Shapiro covering for this guy. Um, play this uh, clip. Do we have it? OK. Now it's turning out it's not just old people, Bob, but just today and, and yesterday. Some uh, startling facts came out. It's not just old, older yeah, exactly. young people to plenty of young people. So you, what's going on give in me an, a, a moment of talking to somebody, going through this with Fauci or somebody who kind of, uh, it caused a pivot in your mind because it's clear just from what's in on the public record that you went through 
a pivot on this to, oh my God, the gravity is uh, almost inexplicable and unexplainable. Well, I think, Bob, really, to be honest with you... Sure, I want you to I be. wanted to... Uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. Yeah, and he had said earlier, too, though, that he would said about the five times more uh, deadly than uh, the flu and whatnot. And when he says panic, he doesn't want to cause a stock market panic. There is no panic amongst the public. What does a panic amongst the public about coronavirus look like? Mm -hmm. I'm going to just really put on two masks? Like what is a what, like what do you do in a panic where there's a pandemic? Yeah, like it, it could look like people refusing to go to work. I but that's true, but I mean the bottom line is, is like it's not like there's that's you know, people are going to get hurt in that way. You can encourage it's not like let me put it this way. It's not like you're yelling fire in a crowded um a theater where people could get trampled in the panic. Right, when it would drive them to adopt sensible public health measures to keep them alive. Yes, they're you're getting overly cautious. Like people are washing their hands too many times, Bob. I don't want them to panic in that way. The word panic he's talking about is a panic sell-off. This is a term of art of the stock market. They don't just say panic. When you say it's creating a panic, people know what that means on the stock and and you know if they work with stocks. That's what he's talking about. Yeah. I even fear we might be being too charitable here because think about after these tapes were recorded, he shows up at one press conference talking about injecting bleach and sunlight, like put the, put his subsequent public comments in the context of this private conversation that was had previously. And I, I think you framed it perfectly when you said that it resolves the stupid versus evil distinction. You know, I think a lot of people basically recognize the president's seeming limited capacity and, and make excuses for it. This is someone who's known full well the danger and the risk that he's placing millions of Americans at. And I totally appreciate and understand the outrage towards Bob Woodward that you, you know, indicated at the beginning of the program. But frankly, the president has not taken enough blame for this. Right. I almost fear that people are misdirecting their blame at the journalist. I mean, just think about what the proof is that we've now established that this criminal president, while perpetrating all these other assaults on the public, right? Inciting violence, lying, uh, deploying goon squads to Portland, saber rattling with Iran. At the same time as he's doing all that, he, is, he knows that he's lying to the American public in downplaying these risks. And as we see Republican governors in particular buying his snake oil and suggesting to people, and in fact, passing laws and, and executive orders in their states to allow premature economic openings and inviting kids to summer camps and schools, placing them at risk. I just want every American to understand that this president seems hell bent on driving as many of us into our graves as he can. Yeah. It's it's stunning. Yeah. Here is, what, go ahead. What I said about uh, people not going to work, that's absolutely tied to what you said about the markets, right? Like he's not concerned that people are going to get lonely and bored if they all stay home from work, right? right? He's concerned that the stonks are going to go down. Exactly. Here is uh, Ben Shapiro, who is in some way trying to parse uh, the uh, these revelations, I guess. And, you know, that's that is the power of audio recording at the end of the day. It just becomes like this is something very accessible to people. They can listen to it. And then, you know, just as easy as they can listen to Ben Shapiro say, don't believe your ears. This has not stopped anybody from jumping to the to the conclusion they wish to jump to, which is that Trump knew full well how bad things were in early February. And then he lied about it. OK, that is not correct. Okay, let's go through, first of all, what Trump's comments look like. And then we'll parallel them with what exactly Andrew Cuomo's comments look like, because as you will see, they're kind of parallel. Right? Oh, Everybody was kind of figuring this out. At this is this is this is a uh, um, oh, wonderful. I should tell you that Donald Trump is the president of the United States. Andrew Cuomo is the governor of New York. There is no, the governor of New York's ability to oversee, let's say a, I don't know, a CDC or a pandemic task force, or to talk to world leaders who are experiencing um, a pandemic in their countries. There is a disparity between those things. It is not a, these are not, Andrew Cuomo's comments are downstream 
from Donald Trump's comments. Andrew Cuomo knowledge of what's going on is downstream from the president's knowledge of what is going on. I just want to make that clear to everybody. And I am no Andrew Cuomo fan. I think people know that, but go ahead. They're kind of parallel. Right? Everybody was kind of figuring this out at the same time. So the basic story here, which is that Trump knew in February, early February, everyone was going to die from the virus. And then he lied about it. So to what end exactly? Nobody knows. Right? What, what exactly was the end of it? I've yet to hear an excuse for why this would happen. It's sort of like when, when the left claimed that Bush lied to, to lie America into war in Iraq. Why? To, to what end? So that we could get involved oh, in it. Oh, I can answer both those questions. We already said, one, he wants to keep the stock market up because he said, we can sustain a couple hundred thousand people dying. In fact, we have, we're all here. The stock market's up and that's all he seems to care about. And why did George Bush lie us into uh, an Iraq war? Well, you can ask Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, there was a myriad of different reasons why they wanted to. Uh, different people had different agendas. I suspect that it really ultimately had to do with making sure that U.S. had some hege hegemony over the spigot of oil coming out of Iraq, which is exactly why the foreign policy establishment continues to support a guy who chopped up a, uh, a, a U.S. journalist. And um, and the fact that Donald Trump, it's been revealed, saved his ass. And you don't hear the war tribunals, uh, the the uh, going on. So I answer both those questions very quickly for Ben Shapiro. We continue. Quagmire war for for a decade. Well, what, what exactly was the purpose? If Trump was lying about the virus, knowing right. Not that he made a mistake, not that he botched it by downplaying it. Right. That all of that is fair game that he lied about it, that Trump lied in order to do what? Seriously, in order to do what? So he knew early February that COVID was going to kill everybody. And then he was just like, I'm going to downplay it for fun. Like why? To, to increase the stock market? But as soon as the, the news broke, the stock market was going to crash. Why? To uphold his electoral possibilities? As soon as COVID hit, it was going to be obvious that Trump had misstated the case. And that was going to hurt him politically. So what would be the purpose of the lie? Again, I think we ought to distinguish between people saying dumb crap, which again is a hallmark of this administration, and lying outright that he's not he was not lying about covid okay we just thought that he wouldn't get caught in the lie we have to bend over backward to adopt that analysis it's so preposterous so, so is he saying I, just say, I just want to just add one thing to that ben shapiro is the most widely consumed source of news on facebook period end of story oh god that's so bad so wait I'm trying to follow his kind of twists and turns. Maybe I'm just uh, not operating at a high enough level today to understand him. But is he saying that there would the, the fact that the lie was going to come out eventually means that there would be no point in Trump having lied to begin with? Yeah, his argument would suggest that no one who ever lied would have a reason to do it. Which like, just, you would never lie because you would assume that it would come out. Now, we're just lucky that Bob Woodward's publishing date of his book was in September as opposed to late November, because it certainly, uh, under the Bush administration, it was the case that the book came out after the election. This time it didn't. And if it and doesn't- Bob Woodward. I mean, this is a yeah. problem that infects the press generally. People forget that the New York Times put George Bush in the White House the second time. There was a story that they sat on for a year, yeah. the precursor to the Snowden revelations. They had that story in 2004. And if the New York Times did its damn job and reported all the news that's fit to print, Bush never gets a second term. But mm -hmm. the corporate media, as a, you know, I reflected on this in the context of my own race, corporate media haven't had hosted a debate between anyone and Nancy Pelosi in 32 years. The internet didn't even exist the last time she showed up to talk to, to debate anybody and defend her record. How can you get away with as much power as she has in the U.S. government for an entire generation without ever defending your ideas in public? You saw the way that she crumbled ATMs under the- ATMs were new. Let's put it that way. ATMs were new. At that right. fact. <laughs> no one had cell phones yet. You no, know, like, no, 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 no. You just have to get like, like, I don't even think they had like the big massive car phones yet. Maybe they had those, like they were just rolling those things out and they were literally the size, like you need your whole trunk, right. the car phone. Oh yeah. My dad is really into gadgets. He definitely had one of those when I was a kid. Uh, but there's, there is Shapiro and 
you know, they, uh, I, I mean, this is a long time right wing. It is when the Republicans fail, it's all, all, either just stupidity or weakness. There's no intent with the Republican Party, according to these guys. There's no reason why, why uh, Donald Trump would do that. Well, it's the stock market. You already mentioned it yourself. It's the stock market. And re-election. I mean, he named that too. He actually named yep. exactly the two answers to the yeah. question, the straw man that he's constructing. And, and the, uh, you know, I think Jamie nailed it. It's just every, anyone who tells a lie presumes that they're not going to get caught. I mean, the people who were lying about me presumed they weren't going to get caught. Right. I mean, I, I and, and frankly, the press in that case too, didn't hold them to account. I mean, the capacity of the press to, and I think this is a real crisis in our democracy because it doesn't just implicate the interests of the target. It implicates all of us who share an interest in policy. And that is to say everyone choking on the air on the West coast this week oh, and everyone who might have kids or grandkids who might, who they might want to survive the climate crisis or anyone who has a family member in the military that might be sent out at the drop of a hat to wage some neo-imperial war supported by corporate Democrats. If I may, just one thing I want to make sure gets just mentioned today, it being the anniversary of a, a horrific experience that our nation ex experienced 20 years ago is what happened since then. People are today talking about fascism in the United States. I know not where it started necessarily. I think it frankly started long before that, especially if we think about the experience of African-Americans in a country that's never, ever at any point in our history actually practiced our commitments to equal rights. But setting aside that unique piece, just in the last 20 years, I mean, I've seen the rise of authoritarianism in the United States in slow motion over the course of my legal career. I've done nothing but fight it since I graduated from law school in 2003. And corporate Democrats dragged us here. It's not as if the authoritarianism that Trump is threatening just hatched overnight. It didn't start in 2016. I think about the last Democratic president who engineered a historic crackdown on the press. There were more whistleblowers yep. and journalists prosecuted as espionage agents by the Obama administration and the, the, the entire preceding history of the United States. And now today we have a publisher being prosecuted for an act of journalism for the first time. I was arrested in the U.S. Senate for an act of journalism in 2015, and the criminalization of journalism long predates this criminal president. And so many people wring their hands as if the threat to our republic was partisan. The threat to our republic is bipartisan. And it has been waged in the open for decades. And too many people haven't recognized it. We just had uh, a federal court, I believe it was just a couple of days ago, uh, find that the NSA a bulk uh data why don't you uh, just uh, sure. uh, talk to that because obviously you were at the eff and and uh, i imagine you did at least some work on that yeah certainly the issue though not the case of so the the aclu won a case in the ninth circuit court of appeals holding that uh mass surveillance under section 215 of the patriot act was illegal under the statute the case didn't directly hold, address its constitutionality but one thing that was really interesting in the case the majority opinion specifically noted in lots of different places the very profound public service performed by a person vilified by everyone in Washington, including my general election opponent, Nancy Pelosi, as a traitor. Yep. Edward Snowden is living in exile, having given up his career and his country to do the right thing, to let us, we the people, know that our government officials were lying to us on the record. When I was arrested in the Senate, it was for asking the obvious question that his revelations revealed. I asked the director of national intelligence under the Obama administration, how do you justify never facing a charge for perjury when you lied to the Senate under oath about mass surveillance and Eric Garner was just killed in the street in New York City without a charge or a trial for selling cigarettes? Either one of those things is bad enough. Powerless people meeting lethal so-called justice for trivial crimes or powerful people escaping any modicum of justice for grave, severe offenses to the entire public documented on the public record, but you put the two together? How can we claim to in any way embody our principles? We don't live under a system that respects the rule of law by a long shot. And this isn't new. That was five years ago. And we've seen what's happened in the five years since this criminal president came to office. I think many Americans have a Pollyannish view so a very false sense of security about the legitimacy of our government. <clears throat> I have seen for entirely too long double standards, exposures of 
of falsity and, and complicity and grave abuses. And I, you know, this is all just the tip of the iceberg. We could go back, for instance, to the CIA torture that remains underreported and underexposed, covered up actively by corporate Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi. We now that. have uh, a director of the CIA who was intimately involved in that torture regime. Yep. And, and you're talking, just to be clarified, you're talking about James Clapper. I think it was a question that uh, Ron Wyden asked him, maybe it was, uh, right. in, in the Senate hearing, uh, specifically about that, um, uh, the spying that was uh, that was going on. But um, this this notion of 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 of, of, of Obama and, and I mean, we had Nancy Pelosi brag at one point that she stood in the way of impeachment hearings against George Bush for Even his though she knew the WMD claim was a lie, she said. Yes, that that was I mean, and that was incredibly underreported. She I think she said this. What was it about a year ago mm-hmm. on some type of CNN like town hall or some some type of like I can't remember exactly what it was. She bragged about it. She thought that she'd done the republic a favor by blocking Bush from being impeached for lying us into a war that killed millions of people. She was using it as a way of saying her bona fides. Like I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do uh, impeachment. Like I'm the one who stopped us from impeaching George W. Bush. And I knew and we all knew that there was no weapons of mass destruction. You know, yeah. that's the thing is that we sit here and we say, you know, uh, ben Shapiro is uh, talking about like, why would George W. Bush lie about weapons of mass destruction? It becomes much harder to hold those people to account when Nancy Pelosi is coming out 15, 17, 18 years later saying, oh, yeah, no, we knew. No, we just didn't do anything about it. The American public, and this is the thing, it, it gets back to what we were talking about, uh, Donald Trump's ability to lie to the American public. The American public, broadly speaking, they don't pay attention to politics. If what the Democratic Party does in response to the Republicans is the very least that it takes to make the American public think there's something wrong, you know, like there's this habit of the media where it says like, well, the Democrats aren't pushing back on this, so we don't have to report what the objective reality is, because if the Democrats aren't pushing back on it, how, you know, can yeah. we assess what the objective reality is? No, they only report on manufactured controversies. And, but the point being that the, if the Democrats don't step up as a baseline and say this is wrong, there's no way within the context of the way our society works, all of it that the American public is going to come to that understanding. Like right. the impeach, you saw it in the context of impeachment. You know, like it was an anemic impeachment. We've already talked about how Nancy Pelosi stood in the way of a whole host of other things. But as soon as the Democrats stood up and said, this is wrong, we need to impeach him, American public's uh, perspective changed because it's like, it's a reaction shot. You know, it's like, I could say something and if you guys just nod and smile, then it's just going to go right by. But if I say something and you know, all you guys are going, what? People, it gives a cue to people that, hey, wait, there's something wrong here. I should pay attention. And if the Democrats aren't going to do that, the Democrats are going to be that complicit that they knew that D- George Bush was lying, but I still stood in the way of any impeachment. And that's a feather in my cap. We can't expect the democracy to work. Yeah. They do this. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Well, maybe people were paying attention when she said that maybe people weren't, but I definitely think that she undermined her own credibility with uh, normal people, Democratic voters, when she admitted to that. Because after that, like, how can you trust anything that she, any decision she makes, anything she decides to pursue or not pursue? Right. How bad does it have to be and for her to do something? Like, Oh, I'll tell you how bad. Even if the sky turns red, and an entire coast chokes on their breath, they will do nothing. This pattern of acknowledging a problem and doing nothing about it, it's not confined to the impeachment of Bush. I mean, climate catastrophe comes to mind as like the most glaring example of this. And I contrast particularly the possibly understandable failure of climate denialists who, you know, maybe we could say they're just ignorant, 
or you know, didn't get it. But Nancy Pelosi and corporate Democrats claim to understand the science. They claim to believe the scientists. They claim to understand that climate change is real. And they just go about their lives blithely deferring to the very same corporate industries that delivered us into this crisis. Mm -hmm. And this pattern of acknowledging an issue rhetorically and then doubling down on the failed policies that have created these crises, that is the pattern of the corporate Democratic Party. And it's exactly why we need to replace some people who have served in Congress entirely too long. Yeah. So getting back to the... um the impact that the Woodward tapes are going to have on the race for a moment. I think this is pretty telling. Um, Brett Baer now granted he's in the news part of Fox news and he's not a uh, primetime commentator, but I, I suspect moments like this are going to be problematic uh, because you're not, you're not going to get the typical Hannity voter. There's nothing that you're going to ever tell them that's going to change the way they vote. People got to remember, again, Donald Trump won with less votes than Mitt Romney lost in 2012 in all of these places. And so Donald Trump's agenda is he has got to depress Joe Biden's uh, vote as much as possible. And they are working on this. They're working on the state Supreme Court of Wisconsin where they delay the ballots going out. They're working on it by by handicapping the uh, post office so that it doesn't have the ability uh, to do these things or at least starting the story. They're working on it by undermining the election, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of like a traditional political campaign, stories like this inhibit Donald Trump's ability to build some type of narrative on Joe Biden. It may have already gone. I mean, Hillary Clinton had a built-in narrative uh, about her. Well, I don't want to litigate at this moment whether it was deserving or not. It's irrelevant. The point is, is that she showed up with a 30-year narrative built about her and Donald Trump just picked up that mantle. He doesn't have the time to do it with Joe Biden. He's certainly not going to have the time with Brett Baer is talking to his campaign spokesperson. This is Tim uh, Murtaugh on uh, on Fox. Uh, First of all, you just heard what was said. They're coming hard after the president for what he said to Bob Woodward and what he said on the record. Well, Brett, I mean, what you heard there from T.J. Ducklow is that he couldn't articulate an answer to your question of what would Joe Biden have done differently. And we know without, a que- without question that President Trump's move to restrict travel from China saved thousands of American lives. Dr. Fauci says so. All medical experts say so. And we know that Joe Biden would not have done that. He called it hysterical xenophobia and fear mongering. And what you have now with the, in the wake of the, the excerpts from the Bob Woodward book is that I think what's happened and what's got everybody all excited is that's all packaged up and it says Bob Woodward's name on the cover. But in fact, the things that are contained in there are the same things that President Trump was saying publicly. He views it as part of his that's job not true, as president Jim. of the United it's States. It's not yes, true. It is. When to he was saying publicly calm, that the virus yes, would go from 15 to zero and then it was magically going to wash away, that is not the same thing. He's telling Bob Woodward that it's a deadly virus that travels over the air and it's really serious and I like to downplay it. He was was not saying the same things publicly but, as Brett, he was but, well, privately listen, to Bob that, that it was public knowledge at the time. The Washington Post and others, and it was discussed in, in coronavirus briefings, uh, everyone knew that it was transmitted through things like okay, coughing Okay, but what you just seizing. said was whether what he was saying privately and publicly the president, was the same. It's not. The, Dr. Fauci says it is the same. You just played the soundbite from him. I, Dr. Fauci said there was no was appreciable difference between what the president was discussing privately versus what he was saying publicly. With Fauci, you just not with Bob Woodward. From Dr. Fauci. With Fauci, not Bob Woodward. The, the, I want to move on. The, the, let me, the question let me, is, the question let me just is, was get the this. president being straight with the American people? And he was. Okay. Every Democrats. Every step of the way, the president was straight with the American people. There is no question of that. <laughs> uh, Shahid, uh, here's some free advice. Don't get a campaign uh, spokesperson like that guy. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I, uh, I've, I've, I've had challenges recruiting. Uh, uh, who that's got to, I mean, that, like stuff like that. I don't know who's going to see that on Fox News and how many people watch that at Fox News. But I mean, 
you'd be hard pressed to walk away from that going like, hey, man, this could be a little bit of a problem. Brett Bear seems really convinced that uh, Donald Trump was saying something different uh, to Bob Woodward that he was saying publicly. I agree with you, though. I also think we have to acknowledge the extent to which, and this goes back to, you know, we're sort of riffing on parts of this before. It's not just the case that many Americans don't pay attention to politics and remain ignorant of it, but many of them, many of us who do uh, engage in any way, predicate their feelings on, on feelings rather than facts. And right. so this, you know, this idea, you can expose the lies all we want, and it won't necessarily make a difference to people who have a frame and can't confront the cognitive dissonance between the facts and their impressions. And you know, I just fear here that even this bald revelation of the president's, frankly, predation targeting the American people, the malfeasance, active malfeasance, even the exposure of it, I fear, won't necessarily reach the ears or at least the hearts of his supporters. And I think that the, the key in making this stick is exactly where you know, that dialogue ended. The claim by his spokesperson was that the idea that the president wasn't straight with the American people, that there's no question there, that what is, there's no question there is that the president was lying, not only lying to the American people, but downplaying risks that have left hundreds of thousands of people dying alone while gasping for breath. I mean, I, I guess I, I guess my point is less that it's going to persuade people, but more just like when you are six weeks out from an election and you're having to finish your comments with the president didn't lie about, you know, something that was going to kill hundreds of thousands of Americans. You don't have you're just you're just not on message like you're just like you're not. Right. I, I am quite convinced that there, the number of people who are going to switch from Trump to Biden is almost immeasurably small. It's just that they feel that they need to plug those holes as opposed in their spending their resources. And at this point, which is just time, like if, if this revelation comes out in February or March of this year, I don't think it has any resonance from a electoral standpoint. I think it would have saved lives, frankly. I think it would have changed the entire trajectory of this. I don't think it has the electoral resonance. The reason why it has resonance now is simply because it eats up the one resource that the Trump campaign needs, which is time. They, you know, like with, with, with the Clinton uh, Trump election, it was literally, do we have enough time to speed up the rate in which she is dropping in favorable favorability uh, versus uh, our dropping in favorability. That's the Trump campaign. Like literally it was like two, two, two anvils dropping uh, from a roof. And it was just a question of which one was gonna arrive on the ground after the other one uh, in terms of where their, their, their polling was. Um, and I just think this inhibits um, their ability to, you know, they want to be out there saying Joe Biden's a liar right. and or whatever it is. And they don't have the time to do that because they're they're protecting their own candidate from 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 basically what you call uh, predation. And I, and I think that's accurate. Um, Keeping right, this news cycle is really critical, too, because I think, you know, to your point, the attention of the American public and the press are both quite ephemeral and there's plenty of time left for people to frankly grow distracted by something else. And so making sure that this theme of the president's predation, lies, uh, and, and malfeasance. I think that that's a, I hope very much that Democrats make that a continuing theme and, and don't allow that to fade from the public consciousness between now and the election. Yeah. And, and there's a side that this is working, right? Because you just cited a poll the other day, Sam, about how um, Trump is losing a white working class voters, specifically women. And I imagine that that has something to do with his handling of the COVID crisis. Oh, it's got so it seems to me like, you know, I think the, the influence of swing voters is often overplayed. I think we should also be talking about all the people who don't come out to vote, especially yeah. uh, poor people, minorities uh, who would either vote for the Democrat or nobody. That's uh turnout is, is at least as important, but you know, persuasion, swing voters also do play a role. And uh, it seems to me like this, this information is finally starting to break through to them. Can I make one point here that just connects two parts of our conversations? I think what, what Jamie just said is really important. Traditional media sources focus on swing voters and that reflects a structural bias and yep. an ideological bias because the greater number of people 
are the Americans who choose not to vote. And the reason they choose not to vote, I think there might be many. One reason might be because Republican state legislatures around the country, to your point, Sam, have frankly spent years shredding voting rights to keep people from voting. Uh, and, and that's a pernicious problem. But another reason that so many people don't vote is frankly that they're not inspired because corporate Democrats don't actually show up for the policies that a majority of Americans want, desire, and even need, like Medicare for all, like climate justice, like alternatives to policing. If Democrats show up for those values, <clears throat> we can win votes from people who've chosen before not to participate. If I can give an example of this, like here close to home, you know, the professional campaign staff who worked for me before the primary, who we noted, you know, have been critical since, among the things that they told me was don't bother going to the neighborhoods like Hunters Point and Bayview that I mentioned before, where there've been these long running environmental disasters, because in the view of traditional campaign operatives, there aren't any votes in these places. Right because they look at the turnout from the past. And my response is, well, if you're running a campaign like a professional career operative, like, yeah, that might be the lesson to learn from this. As a candidate, my lesson to learn from that is nobody showed up for this community in a generation. That's why there aren't any votes there. And if we show up for the non-voters to entice them to participate, they will dwarf these swing voters who corporate Democrats keep chasing to the derogation of their own interests and to the to undermining their own constituents. I think that there's a real profound point in the, the, that Jamie riffed on there. And I think the Democrats have to recognize that the sleeping giant of American politics is not the swing voters. It's the disaffected voters. That's where the votes are. And that's how we're going to win is showing up for working people struggling in the face of all our challenges. I think, I think there's, there's two things. I think one is it is, I think on some level, hard to get those people to vote, but there has not been a sustained effort to, to address their concerns and get them out. And uh, sustained, I mean like multi-cycle uh, effort that is geared towards that. Um, a, and B, I also do think that there is in some, amongst some Democrats, and I think th there is a, an attempt to fashion their electorate in a way that is going to give them more flexibility to provide for both their donors' interests and their electorate's interests. Um, this is, you know, Chuck Schumer or Ed Rendell, I can't remember who it was that said it. Um, for every, uh, you know, blue collar vote that we lose in Pittsburgh, we're gonna pick up uh, three in the Philadelphia suburbs, and we're gonna do that in Wisconsin, and we're gonna do that in Michigan. Prescient in some ways, <laughs> uh, in terms of the states that were noted, uh, but, um, uh, inaccurate in terms of what the outcome was going to be. And I'm quite convinced, you know, uh, that one of the, the least uh, analyzed aspects of what happened in 2016 was the iron will of the, of, of the, of the Clinton campaign and the democratic leadership to protect Paul Ryan. And, and to keep Paul Ryan from holding to account to, to Donald Trump, they had a huge opportunity to try and force a cleavage between those two. They never took it. They never, ever took it. And they, I think they did that because they wanted to, uh, you know, uh, Chuck Schumer bragged in October. This is uh, almost a direct quote. I've got Schumer, because I remember this because he spoke about himself in the third person. I've got Schumer, I've got uh, Clinton, and I've got uh, Ryan. And we're going to make a, um, a repatriation deal. He was talking about the offshore money that's been held over there since the 2005 moratorium on taxes that George Bush had for, uh, for, for money that is uh, kept offshore. We're going to do a repatriation on the tax deal. You're going to bring all the money back instead of it being at 15 or 25, uh, 20 percent where it should be uh, corporate uh, rates. It's going to be at like 7 percent. And half of that is going to go to an infrastructure bill. And that's the way that they were thinking. And they wanted to protect Paul Ryan uh, so that he wouldn't be undermined by his own um, uh, uh, caucus. And, you know, it's 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 one of those things where you can, you know, you try and surgically design your electorate. We're going to get those suburban voters who are not going to be too concerned, who are not going to constrain us on these taxes and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, it's a crap it, show. it might work for them this time around just because Trump is so terrible. And it's been working for them for, for decades, not in the sense of them 
holding on to power versus the Republicans, but certainly in the sense of keeping things exactly the way they are. All the leadership of the party keeps their jobs. They keep their net- networks of patronage in place. And that is far more important to them at the end of the day. Um, also, if I could jump back one topic um, to the, the idea of activating non-voters in uh, especially in poor communities, um, I think you're really right that um, we need to have a sustained effort from year to year, election cycle to election cycle. Um, but it's not going to work if people only hear from us when we want them to vote for our candidate, right? right. Which is why it's so important to have an organization, maybe, maybe it's a party, maybe it's just a party-like organization that is uh, organizing the left, that's in communities all the time, doing mutual aid, talking to people, finding out who is already doing organizing and activism in these communities, and really asking them what they need and learning from each other in a kind of give and take process that coheres uh, a a political vision and um, helps to build working class institutions and power in a much more long lasting way. Because, you know, a candidate can get up there and like someone like Bernie Sanders could say, I want to fight for Medicare for all. I'm going to give everyone health care. I'm going to give everyone college, blah, blah, blah. They've heard all those things before. So it probably, and it wasn't enough to, to penetrate all of the institutional forces acting against them. So yeah, we got to, it's, it's an everyday fight 24 seven. Yes. And I think that there's another, you did it again, where you like nailed on some really crucial points that I think, you know, a, a point to a whole further discourse. And, and I think one of the things I want to draw out here as a candidate speaking to the needs of my communities is the need for organizing. And, and particularly in between electoral cycles, I come to electoral politics having been a direct action organizer for 20 years. And that was what I, that was my first acts of political engagement were shutting down weapons contractors during the lead up to the war in Iraq. And with 20,000 other residents of San Francisco laying siege to the financial district to try to pull the plug on a corporate invasion using an event that happened 19 years ago as a pretext. And this idea of coming to the the dominance of electoral politics over politics generally serves to undermine our democracy. The most important layer of politics is at the community level. If there's any place I push back, you know, Jamie, with your construction there, it's that I think it's less about organizations organizing in communities and much more about communities organizing within themselves. And I think that the mutual aid organizing that's happened in the wake of the pandemic, I think to me, indicates a real uh, reason for hope because at the end of the day, beyond electoral politics, the only way we can actually claim power as a people is sustained coordinated work stoppage. A general strike is like the one ring to rule them all. And the only way that that happens is when communities have organized within themselves and have the resiliency to abdicate the market, to have food, childcare, transportation without needing to pay for it. If you, if, until communities build non-market-based alternatives, like until we build the new in the shell of the old, like they did in the Montgomery bus boycott, people forget it wasn't just not taking the bus, the community organized a ride network. When we do the same thing now, that's what will enable the general strike to take our resistance to this corrupt establishment beyond the ballot box. And I, I see that vision demonstrated at multiple points in our history. The Occupy movement comes to mind the general strike in the 19, 1934 here in, in San Francisco, there've been others around the country, that kind of organizing, that's what puts, that's what turns the screws on the establishment. The establishment's been turning screws on we the people for a long time. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree with you about all of that, but I also think that we really have our work cut out for us in terms of the gap currently existing between the organized left and the wider working class as a whole. And, you know, it's not a problem specific to uh, the DSA right now, although I'm in the DSA, so I talk about it a lot in reference to that. Like, if you the look DSA at where- The DSA has problems in this, though, to be frank. Sure, sure. But, it, like, if you look at the labor movement in the 1930s, where it was, like, um, a pretty pretty closey Venn diagram with all of the communists and anarchists in this country, and then if you look at it now, the organized left is, you know, largely downwardly mobile middle class millennials more white than not white and uh like the the organized left has its work cut out for us because the majority of the working class doesn't uh doesn't really like us yet or isn't uh 
or or maybe isn't even really aware. And there's definitely a strong, um, I'm not saying that these organizations are not uh, working class people because everyone I know in DSA works for a wage, but our class background is different than that of the wider working class on average. And this is a gap that needs to be closed by basically doing everything in our power, everything we could possibly think of to get out in communities. And um, like like you were talking with mutual aid, um, I think mutual aid is really important, but also um, I've seen a lot of the mutual aid that's been going on during COVID. Um, is it necessarily truly mutual, right? It's mostly richer transplants in a neighborhood um, doing what's basically charity work for the poorer people who live there and are in need. And that's really good. Like I would never say, like I've participated in it. I would never say that that's bad, but we have our work cut out for us if we want it to become more of a, more of a mutual, more of a truly mutual thing and a, a more, uh, a, a full integration within communities of, of all the different strata there. And in terms totally of like this, the Go sequencing, ahead. it also seems to me that, um, we, one of the challenges to to that type of community organization is the transitory nature of of, of people in this day and age, as opposed to let's say the 1930s or or in any other era uh, of the country. And 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 that's why I think like you know, when when I think about a policy like um, like Medicare for all, and I and I imagine there may be some other policies, but I don't know one that it would be so dramatic where the where there is a almost an explicit uh, element of the policy that says we are connected in some fashion, right? I mean, there's like, you know, even like mask wearing has, has some element of, of this uh, where it's like, oh, wow, my mask is actually to protect you. Yours is, is to protect me. I guess we are not, you know, islands uh, unto ourselves. I mean, I think that there are policies that can be implemented that will um, have the byproduct of creating these bonds that exist. I mean, like I said, you know, we had unions and local unions would create these relationships that were just relationships between people like, hey, you know, we, you and I are, we're not, we're not fa actual family, but we're sort of like in the same sort of family. And, and this is what our each other brothers and sisters are to each other. And, um, and, you know, on some level, we don't have the small institutions that help create that sense um, in some way, and they need to be manufactured. Uh, it, like, you know, there needs to be some framework and structure for these things. Mm -hmm. That's why I think like teachers, teachers unions have had the most success in this, in this like age that we're living in because they are, there is a, structured environment where people come together and rely on each other. The parents rely on the teachers, the students rely on the teachers and the parents. There's a, there is a almost like a forced union of these, um, these people brought together mm -hmm. by their disparate needs, which are met by each other. And um, they're, 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 you know, sort of, forced into that thing. I mean, I guess, you know, for me, it's always like, I look at it in terms of like sitcom structure, uh, you know, like just as a, as a writer, it's like, you know, how can I create an environment where these, these people are locked in, uh, essentially locked in a room with each other. And as much as they may or may not, you know, be disparate, uh, they're, they're they have a shared agenda and that shared agenda ends up developing the relationship over time. All right, let's go to the uh, phones. A lot of people have been holding for a long time. We're not going to get to Virtually any of them, but we will get to this one. 516, you're calling from a 516 area code. Who's this? Who are you, where are you calling from? Hey, this is AJ from Long Island. AJ from Long Island, what's on your mind? Uh, so in a recent article in Jacobin by Andrew Perez and David Sirota, it was asserted at the end that Woodward's silence about the Trump tapes is a crime against humanity. I uh, showed it to some of my friends and my uh, libertarian lawyer friend kind of made fun of it and said how it's absurd to call that a crime against humanity. Uh, he also claimed that Trump's like doublespeak about the virus isn't a crime against humanity, which I guess is another discussion. But I was wondering what you guys think about the phrasing of that accusation against Woodward. And furthermore, just what you think about the role of publications like Jacobin and like 
whether or not you'd call them propaganda and if it is propaganda, whether or not that's a good thing. Uh, Cause I kind of tend to think it is, but I wonder if like maybe claims like crime against humanity should be explained and justified more. Cause I think an argument could be made, but I, I don't know exactly. So just wondering uh, your guys takes. All on right. That. Well, I'll let you go. Appreciate the call. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I, I mean, I don't know if it's a crime against humanity, uh, but I just think that it people should see it for what it is. It is monet, you know, valuing his career and monetary agenda above the the notion of of journalism to help people. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that constitutes a crime against humanity, but that's what it is. And he is a celebrated journalist in a profession that ostensibly, um, you know, sees themselves as, uh, you know, as, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, what is it? Democracy dies in the, in the darkness. And it's like, well, I got news for you. Um, you know, this, uh, you want to call it greed, you want to call it capitalism, whatever it is that, uh, that, that motivated uh, Bob Woodward, um, that seems to be sort of like, creating a little darkness like you know you 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 kept this thing shrouded in darkness for a long time if democracy dies in the darkness like it's not the darkness does not have to be in perpetuity it's probably for a certain period of time in which uh democracy dies and that's what he did right i mean that's what he did it's not to let uh, donald trump off the hook he is i think donald trump that's arguably a crime against humanity um i don't know that um that uh, that that for Woodward it is I think and um, and I would address that and I would say is Jacobin uh, propaganda I I don't know I mean I have always described myself on some level as an aspiring propagandist uh, I don't um, I, I I think the term is is value neutral um, I have I, I don't I don't lie uh, I do my best to correct the record uh, but I think it's you know. I have an ideological perspective and uh, that's what makes my, informs my editorial choices. And uh, you know, and I don't know, is that propaganda? Maybe. But- it's certainly true of every journalist. Every, every journalistic outlet has an editorial perspective and people that claim that mainstream <clears throat> press organizations aren't propaganda, frankly, are being too charitable to them. You know, we described before how the New York Times swung the 2004, the New York Times liberal bastion swung the 2004 election for a Republican president. The Associated Press called the 2016 California primary the night before it happened. (laughs) Figure, like, tell me how that makes sense, right? Like this idea that the press doesn't have, that the mainstream press doesn't have an editorial interest, a structural bias in favor of Wall Street, frankly, flies in the face of the facts. And so I I, I think to to whatever extent, the roles of uh, publications like Jacobin or others have like a role here. It's, it's frankly holding the press and the establishment accountable for their own propaganda. And, and, and just to go to the first part of this question, I absolutely agree with you that the president has been guilty, frankly, of any number of crimes against humanity. And I think the particular one here was his, his comments to the public, any of his comments to the public downplaying the severity of this pandemic when he knew full well as documented in the tapes, how bad it would be. I understand why people are concerned about the press ethics implicated in the timing of Bob Woodward's release. I don't know if that, the press timing, rises to the level of a crime against humanity. It certainly implicates press ethics in ways that raise how the public needs the press to show up for work and to do the job ethically. And I I think, again, this stretches well beyond this particular instance and, and situation, frankly. I see the press, everything from allowing incumbents to go for decades without debating anyone, to not highlighting in the discourse. There is a wave of evictions around the country. How many people know that there's a bill introduced in Congress that would keep millions of Americans in their homes and suspend the payments for rents and mortgages indefinitely until the pandemic's over? You won't hear it from Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't support that bill, but Ilhan Omar does. And if we get some new voices in Congress that are aligned with our communities, that do understand the experiences of people who've had to struggle with these issues instead of just people monetizing them, you know, I think that we'd have different outcomes. Maybe one last thing I'd say, kind of riffing on a thing that Jamie said maybe a few minutes ago about the jobs of the career Democrats and in the establishment. Their interest is not in winning elections. Their interest is in raising funds. 
it's, it's, it's the subversion of democracy by capitalism in the sense of the goals of the Democratic Party being displaced from governance and instead being replaced by the opportunity to frankly secure resources and hire armies of consultants. It, it, that's what passes for governance now from the self-described left and not, not the real left. I mean, this is the, the center left, institutional progressives, right? This is what they do. They're not there to advance principles. They're there to advance their careers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's a problem across context. Absolutely. And, and I'm inclined to believe that they prefer to win if possible, right? Like who doesn't? But they'll only do it if they can do it in a way that doesn't compromise all of those patronage networks that you just named checked. What, what is it called? The iron will of of institutional power, somebody, I can't remember which writer, um, and I don't think it was a particularly um, uh, uh, left ideological writer. I think it may have been Kevin Drum, I'm not even sure. But the, 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 the something to the effect of the iron uh, law of, of institutions, which is you protect your power first within the institution, even if it is at the expense of the power of the institution. Um, and, and, and the power of the institution comes second to your maintenance of power within the institution. Um, you know, you'd rather be, you know, uh, a, a king or queen of the, of the pond before, uh, you're worried too much about how big the pond is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. One reason that socialism is so profound because it reorients the perspective from being about one's own relationship to the institution to instead be about what is the role of the community? And I think that idea of, of, of locating our allegiances in each other, as opposed to ourselves, I think is a really crucial principle that socialism has to offer our civilization at a time when we frankly need it. Dead ass. Meanwhile, meanwhile uh, we have Tucker Carlson taking another turn here. Um, are these two, uh, Brendan, are these two clips meant to... Um, um, follow each other because they really do seem like um it, it is uh it's precious these are about like five minutes apart during it's, his it's this really all right let's start with this this is this is tucker carlson we're gonna play two clips from his opening monologue um which is pretty pretty impressive even for him now to be fair to be fair um this is a guy who's head writer for almost f four years, uh, was a guy who was regularly posting on white supremacist web websites uh, because, and talking about how much of uh, his work was the foundation of every script that Tucker Carlson writes. Now it's so, and you know what? I mean, maybe the guy's not on Fox's payroll anymore, but, it's not like I'm seeing a lot of him on like social media going like, I have no job. I don't know. It's one of those things where, you know, there's a lot of ways of getting paid and uh, uh, it's not unheard of. Let's put it this way for stars of, uh, of, you know, commentary shows like Tucker Carlson's to have their own cadre of writers, still a business expense, but here we go. What's amazing is how cynical it is. People who say this don't even pretend to believe it. They ignore their own slogans. If you really thought America was a white supremacist dystopia, a place where people of color get murdered just for going outdoors, as the Democratic platform suggests is true, <laughs> then you probably wouldn't encourage millions of non-white immigrants to move here. You'd be too worried about their safety. Bringing in people from Africa, for example, would be tantamount to premeditated murder. You wouldn't want that on your conscience. Of course, in real life, it's all fake. The opposite is true, in fact. Africans thrive in this country. Nigerian immigrants to the United States earn more money on average than native-born Americans. Nigerian immigrants are also more likely to get college degrees than people who grew up here. If what BLM is telling us is true, how could this happen? Well, because they're lying. For the overwhelming majority of lower income Americans, melanin is not the main barrier to advancement. Education and social class are. Well, that's an interesting um, 
Uh, Struck. Now, we also know that coincidentally, or maybe not so coincidentally, melanin also uh, dovetails with those areas where people live and their op- educational opportunities and uh, their opportunities to get health care and their opportunities to get uh, food and whatnot. It is not a way- without being shot by a cop. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and, uh, and so there's, um, there is Tucker Carlson, even the BLM people know they don't even believe that there's white supremacy in this country It's just uh, completely made up. I wonder where people got this idea. Here is Tucker Carlson four minutes later, uh, four minutes later, maybe not four, maybe three, um, talking about history seven years after an anarchist assassinated the president of the United States, William McKinley. He was Roosevelt's running mate. In some ways, 1908 isn't so different a period in American history as the one we're living through right now. In 1908, America was fast becoming an unstable country. Mass immigration had made the society far less cohesive. New technology completely upended the way people lived and the way they worked. There was a recession underway in 1908, coupled with high unemployment. People were angry at the banks, at big business, angry at capitalism itself. And there was also racial unrest. During one race riot in 1908 in Springfield, Illinois, mobs burned buildings and attacked citizens in their homes. More than a dozen people died. 1908 was a chaotic moment, so not surprisingly, some people became radical. They called themselves anarchists. They believed in violence. In February of that year, an anarchist shot a priest to death during communion at church in Denver. He cited no reason for doing it. He just said he hated Christianity. A few weeks later, another anarchist tried to assassinate the chief of police of Chicago at his home. Later that month, anarchists staged a deadly riot in a park in Manhattan. uh, Let's just uh, just stop at the the, uh, Springfield uh, race riot that he was talking about, where people burned down all sorts of things. Wow, that's uh, interesting. The part that he didn't tell you about was that this, this was this race riot was specifically really um, about targeting people of one race, people who were black. And there was almost 5,000 um, white Americans uh, who over the course of a couple of days in uh, August in 1908, um, murdered a bunch of black people and burn down their section of town um, in this completely fictional white supremacist country that we have. Uh, You just sort of left that part out. Not an isolated phenomenon either. Think about the Tulsa massacre. This happened all over the United States. This was an era starting uh, in like the post-construction, a reconstruction era where we had the rise of the KKK. By 1920, we're talking about 6 million out and proud KKK members. This is when all of those uh, Confederate statues went up in every town and around the country in places that weren't even the South. Just all of a sudden, 40, 50 years later, they're remembering their heritage that in some cases wasn't even their heritage, unless the heritage had less to do with the cultural, uh, the sort of like, I don't know, mint juleps or whatever it was that people were drinking in the South at that time. And more had to do with the uh, suppression of a race of people to uh, serve as free labor and to subjugate themselves to the dominant race in this country. That's the part that might, I think people were probably reminiscing about and want to remind people of who's in charge. And uh, here, we're going to actually build a statue just to remind you. Mm -hmm. Um, The South is going to rise again, as it was. And lastly, since we're talking about- Can I throw in just one idea there, Sam, before we go on? When we talk about the antebellum South and this history of race in this country, I've always just find it really important to remind people that there are more Americans enslaved today in 2020, legally enslaved than there were at the height of the antebellum South. And the way that happens is in prison. Prison slavery is just like forced servitude in the antebellum period, an object of industrial interest. And when we talked about whether it's you know, capital kicking future generations off a climate cliff by opposing a new deal, a green new deal, whether it's capital uh, supporting wars for profit to fill the pockets of defense manufacturers, whether it's capital forcing people to 
it forced servitude for generations or whether it's capital replicating those systems of forced labor through incarceration. In each of these cases, we see capital emerge with its own independent, enduring influence. And it lurks in the shadows. And when we, just to riff on another piece that we talked about propaganda, when you see propaganda, any media institution that doesn't acknowledge the role of capital in driving everything from federal policy to our wars is propaganda. Mm -hmm. And we should so say the, 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 that dynamic of slavery in prisons was a very explicit uh, measure. There was, it was a negotiation, the 13th Amendment, written during Reconstruction. Well, we'll get rid of slavery, except in prison. And, you know, there's a lot of things. You guys are in charge of the laws. So, you know, if you really need that labor, uh, this is the way that you get it. And mm -hmm. there it is. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is not a, in other words, this is not a perspective that this is slavery in these prisons. It is literally an explicit, the 13th Am Amendment says that we, you can only have slavery in one instance now. Mm -hmm. And that is when people are in prison. It really blew my mind when I found out about that. What words are, but I think it's like indentured servitude can only- That's a condition of punishment. Except as a punishment. And we're also going to make a bunch of new laws that allow us to criminalize black people for basically anything. And just, you know, uh, for those folks who think that like, look, um, we have, um, it is a, uh, it is a time for, uh, for unity in this country and there's no, there's no white supremacy. Um, let's, uh, let's go to Kansas City, Missouri. Arrowhead Stadium, where we have uh, the Chiefs versus the Texans. There is a moment of uh, silence. Um, this is a statement that says the players support equality, ending racism, supporting justice, and Black Lives Matter. Let's let's soak in some of that wonderful lack of white supremacy for that very controversial notion that there should be equality or that we shouldn't have racism, or that we should support justice, or that Black Lives Matter. Let's, uh, let's tune in. That's booing, incidentally. They don't like the idea that the players are standing in solidarity. Thank you. They didn't like the idea that the players were standing in solidarity for them, uh, for each other, and for those of uh, the statement that those players support equality, Black Lives Matter. There it is. Um, well, they're by calling attention to the racism that has been solved. They're the ones doing racism. That's uh, that's just how it is. Exactly. Very mean to white people. All right, let's do some. Uh, uh, um, do we have time for one more call? Uh, maybe let me pull somebody out of here. Uh, Shahid, uh, give me a uh, a number, one through uh, four. Four it is. Let's see, what we got here four. Okay, that's a good one. Call him from a four one five area code. That's uh, actually your neck of the woods. Right on. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, baby, Liverpool. Libertarian Larry here. Oh, oh my God. God. Hello? No, I'm just kidding. This is, oh. this is Stone from, from San Francisco, California. Stone from San Francisco. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Stone. I yeah. appreciate that. Hey. What's on your mind? Hey, I, You're the final I, caller of the week. Great. Wonderful. Um, yeah. Just want to commend Shahid for being out there. You know, I've seen him in basically every neighborhood in San Francisco, uh, pounding the pavement and you know, that's a lot more than you could say for like London Breed when she was District 5. Uh, but uh, anyhow, um, I kind of have to switch my question, but uh, like speaking of slave labor, um, I'm an artist and I had the misfortune of working for Caviar, a gig uh, economy job. And basically like how they work is drought and deluge type pay structure. 
you know, so you get a honeymoon period and basically they just wear you down and wear you completely thin. In a generation. And she did previously oppose it just to be clear until we forced her hand. And I, I want to press on this moment before I get to the policy, because it will reveal a few things. Um, before, maybe 20 minutes ago, we were talking about the importance of organizing at the grassroots layer. One way that happens is organized labor. And organized labor has, uh, frankly, suffered a lot over the past several decades because the law doesn't adequately protect the rights of workers to organize. Now, there's a whole other problem here. I don't want to dig into this, but just to note that labor has also been, unfortunately, in too many places co-opted. Here, where I live in San Francisco, every labor union in the city has either not endorsed in our race or endorsed Nancy Pelosi, even though she undermines the interests of their rank and file. And so the idea that organized labor gets gamed by voting for established power, even when its rank and file needs change, is an independent part of the problem. But let's just go back to the gig economy because it presents novel issues. One other thing here, just to note, as we're getting into the policy, is how gig economy companies make their money. And that's basically by using technology to circumvent labor protections. The, that's the locus of the innovation. It's not productive innovation, it's predatory innovation. And so making sure that labor and laborers and workers have protections as they engage in these new forms of industrial relationships is really important. One of those is making sure that people get benefits. This, there's a law passed in California this year uh, that has, it's generated a lot of controversy, uh, but it, it, it was aimed particularly to help gig workers with the law was called AB5. And the goal was to ensure that workers improperly classified as contractors are instead classified as employees. One of the crazy ironies about all this is that the gig economy companies whose abuses prompted the passage of the law have all refused to comply with it. The law has instead been internalized by actors from uh, music venues that have, you know, stood back from the line to even political campaigns. Uh, you know, our accountants uh, had a, a concern around some of our paid callers at one point. You know, we had to make some shifts be because of this state law that frankly hasn't meaningfully constrained the gig economy companies, but has unfortunately created <clears throat> all kinds of externalities that I don't think the drafters of the law ever aimed to imposed. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that there, there's been some adjustments of that just in the past couple of days, my understanding, right? There's been some yeah. amendments to that that have at least addressed some of those issues, but go ahead. Well, that's right. And I, what I was going to say here is I think as we take those state policies, Justice Brandeis described policies in the states as like laboratories. And as we take these experiments to Congress, the opportunity is to learn from different states regulatory approaches. And so what I'd like to bring to Congress is the kind of reform that ensures that everybody, regardless of who you work for, gets health care. That's what Medicare for all means. It means that we don't have to have at least parts of this debate. We're going to socialize medical care to make sure that that's not a locus of coercion. Right now, many people are driven to participate in gig economy work because they have existential needs like insulin. Well, that shouldn't be a reason to subject yourself to predatory labor conditions. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true in other contexts, right? When we talk about social housing, housing for all, housing shouldn't be a coercive locus either, but it is. Uh, so there, there's some of these broad spectrum programs that help everyone and specific to the gig economy. I want to make sure that, that workers are classified as employees and get employee benefits, that there's also wage transparency, that workers can understand the contours of the deals that they're getting into, and that they can hold the companies accountable to maintain the terms of those agreements instead of arbitrarily changing them as the companies see fit. There's no transparency <clears throat> between the gig economy platforms and the workers. And nothing in this arena has enraged me more than the various exposures of situations where <clears throat> the companies steal the tips. Like what, it's so perverse that you know, if you're a customer, you have an opportunity to leave a tip to the platform and then the company takes it instead of passing it on to the worker. I mean, well, this is outrageous. They need those tips because they're not turning a profit, right? <laughs> like the only thing I would add to what you just said about how these companies make money is they don't even make money. Like the more I learn about the tech industry, the less sense it makes to me. Uh, you would think that, you know, an illegal taxi company running on uh, misclassified labor and evasion of local regulations would at least be somewhat profitable, but they're not. 
Um, the only reason the capital is pouring into these things is because it's running out of places to go. Um, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I did see a, sort of a, an interesting explanation, um, an op-ed by Aaron Bananov in The Guardian, where he argues pretty convincingly that companies like Uber were basically making a, a bet on automation and driverless cars that yep. did not end up paying off. And it makes a little bit more sense to me when I think about it like that. I get the sense that's what I think that's true on some level of Amazon. I think that's true. You know, that's why that's why even like in the context of YouTube, for that matter, and this is a little bit far afield, but um, the reason why Facebook and YouTube rely so heavily on algorithms and are like, you know, we don't do it. It's because they don't want human beings to have to hire human beings right. to do this sort of editorial work. And they are adamant that they don't want to establish that precedent that humans can do this better. <laughs> and they're, they're willing to go through all of these machinations to avoid actually hiring human beings to do this work that human beings could do it much better, frankly. Uh, but they, if they start with that down that road, um, then they, they're going to be held to that level of, of, of functionality. Uh, and, well, and they don't want to do that. So well, I, I, I think a lot of this goes back to the falling rate of profitability and the crisis of profitability going back to the 1970s. And, you know, a lot of Marxists believe the tendency of the rate of profit is to fall over time. And uh, that's why they're going to all these increasingly crazy methods of labor arbitrage. And this is a crisis that is to a large degree overdetermined by the development of capitalism. That said, as long as we have capitalism, we certainly should be forcing the companies to do as right as possible by the people that they're exploiting. All right, let's take some IMs and then we'll get out of here. Hey, Sam, can you recommend a book on the Reconstruction era? Yes, Reconstruction by Eric Foner. That is the... I think, um, definitive, at least in my mind. And, oh, also, um, that guy Blight. What, David what's, Blight. David Blight. He is a uh, professor at Yale, maybe, or he was. He did like a 12-hour Reconstruction audio uh, lecture that is, I guess it's the Civil War, and he does a-, a Civil a, War and a, Reconstruction. Uh, reconstruction. Yeah. And he's got a new book out, right? We're going to book that guy, right? You bet. You bet. Hell yeah. I've been so excited about it. <laughs> oh, you got to go. I've listened, I've listened to that lecture series twice now. It's amazing. Brendan's got to go uh, soon. So we'll, we'll do five of these and we'll get out of here. Everybody else has got to go too. Hawaiian shirt guy, Sam looking kind of fresh. Sam looking clean. Okay. Like the man of my dreams. All right. Thank you. I'm glad. Although I'm praying that Shahid wins, he does have a knack for radio, just saying. So there you go. Uh, Bullprog. We've had some awesome unionizing wins. Incidentally, Bullprog. Um, is uh, the person who did the video in between that okay. you. Uh, we've had some awesome unionizing wins recently in Minneapolis with Local 17, Fair State Brewing Co-op, along with a handful of other brewers, distillers, and coffee roasters, Workers Unite. Tom Hopman, uh, Sam needs some more Sunset Lake CBD gummies so he can stop malding about uh, Pelosi and let uh, his guests speak. Yes, I know. I apologize for that. Uh, no apology necessary for me. I couldn't help myself. Always I, be mildling, Sam. Yes. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, Trump tweeted that Woodward should have reported this conversation months ago if it could have saved lives. I hate to agree with Trump. Uh, Woodward is a chode. J.J. Lake, uh, before Chiefs and Texans, yes, uh, we played that. News sources like the Casey Star immediately came out saying the fans in the crowd were booing at them. While that remains true, there were a few fans booing. Many videos from fans show fans cheering in support. New sources immediately trying to stir disagreement, discussing, I can only think of manufacturing consent. Uh, moon in the lake, we, where are where, be, we are where we are because we never held Republicans accountable for what they've done. Bush Cheney not held accountable. Reagan not for Iran-Contra. Bush Sr. pardoned people in Iran-Contra. Nixon may have been pressured to resign before he pardoned them. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. I agree with that totally. Absolutely. Um, and then I would throw the savings and loan disaster in 87 in there or 85 or 86. I can't remember when it was exactly. Bud Hall, was Thomas Sowell always a reference point for racism deniers and building defender apologists on the far right? Or has he just seemed to have a resurgence lately? I think he's been doing that for a long time, uh, but your mileage may vary. Uh, Silver Ball Stud, the Western I watched this week, Doc with Stacey Keach is on topic. Doc Holliday bucks the party and calls out Wyatt Earp, a cop for putting his personal interest above that of the people's. Uh, three more. Sam is uh, Sam's 
tasty Semitic snack. Okay. Uh, yesterday, the crew briefly spoke about the, the game tonight. We riot. And after download it, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Oh. Maybe oh. this is the game that'll get me uh, back into gaming after a very long hiatus. I will check that out. And let's see, Joyce from PA, too much use of the phrase corporate Democrats. When I hear corporate Democrats over and over again, I feel the same as I do when 9-11 Truther launches into a diatribe on the characteristics of steel in the World Trade Center. That mm. is a very, very, <laughs> very strange reaction to have. Bit of a stretch. What, yeah, I don't know what else to tell you about that. Uh, go, go read up on Chris Coons. And you don't need a degree in physics to figure out uh, that. <laughs> Chris Coons can't melt steel beams. <laughs> Simple socialist. Hey, Sam, I share your concerns about this election. I'm becoming a shit show. Frankly, I'm also concerned about the state of America in general. As Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. And I see a lot of similarities in the rifts in our society and the rifts that appear in several historical republics that fell to fascism. It's going to be a very rough ride the next 150 days, 120 days, folks. Uh, but we will talk more about that. And the final IM of the week. Uh, let's see. It's funny that you asked this. Otto Matlek, can you please do a show with Bob Baltemeyer? I reached out to Bob Baltemeyer. He was a former professor uh, in uh, Manitoba University. He had done research that John Dean had used for the conscience of a conservative on authoritarians and right-wing authoritarians in this country where he said, from a clinical standpoint, there were 25% of North Americans were right-wing uh, uh, authoritarians. Altemeyer was issuing warnings in the summer of 2016, and I reached out to him to try and get him on the show, and I think he was a little nervous, to be honest with you, and um, I, I was thinking the other day, uh, I would like to get him on and, 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 and get his take on what's happening. If I don't know what, what his deal is, but we will check that out. Shahid Buttar, uh, where, where can people get more information on your campaign and uh, maybe help you out? Thanks, Sam. Folks can visit us at shahidforchange.us or on any of the major social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Shahid for Change. And Jamie, Matt, Brendan, have a good weekend. Folks, we'll see you on Monday. Bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot Where the choice is made For the option where you don't get paid